I'm actually, I'm actually or... drinking out of my. <laughs> oh, Gee, yeah, that's nice. Congrats, Nathan. That was just fluke. Are, are we online ready or not? Yes, yeah, Danny, you can go. Okay, guys. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. So we're going to start the last day of the, our uh, Immune Relation Symposium. It's a pleasure to me introduce the chair that is gonna is gonna chair uh, all the conference today. It's Professor Valderes Dutra. She is full professor of uh, in Federal University of uh, Minas Gerais. Uh, Val, please, uh, you can proceed as you wish. Okay. First, I'd like to thank uh, Danielle and Ebert for the for the invitation to be here, and of course for putting together this meeting, which really has been. Uh, fantastic with so many excellent talks. So I hope you feel by now very stimulated to keep this going for the next year. So congratulations to both of you. And of course, thanks to everyone that is here, all the speakers that came together with us since Wednesday, and uh, especially to the three speakers of the roundtable this afternoon, uh, uh, which are Dr. Ramona Herdion from South Africa, Ken Golub from uh, uh, São Paulo, Hospital Israelita Albert Einstein, and Ebert Guedes from uh, UFRJ and Fiocruz in Rio. So uh, we are gonna start our first presentation of the afternoon with Dr. Ramona Herdial, who is coming to be with us uh, actually from Kenya uh, currently at this moment, <laughs> but she is a professor at the University uh, of Cape Town. Ramona hid her PhD and postdoc in immunology from the University of Cape, Cape Town Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine, as well as International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. And uh, she is a senior lecturer and team leader of the Leishmaniasis Group at the University of Cape Town at the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology. Ramona's group have been studying the host factors that promote resistance and susceptibility to cutaneous and visceral mirroring models of Leishman, Leishman infection, trying to find potential targets for host-directed therapies. Within this context, cytokine signaling, lipid signaling, macrophage activation, host drug metabolism, transcription factor activation, and other aspects are things that have, they have been contributing to. So I extend the thanks on behalf of the organizers to Ramona for being here with us. And uh, please take it uh, from, from here, Ramona. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Val. Thank you for that nice introduction. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak uh, at this conference. It's been informative and exciting to say the least. I'm going to go on now to share my screen. If somebody can just shout when they do see it, that will be fantastic. Um, find this guy. Okay, just a okay. Great, we can see it. Oh yeah, that's what I was talking about. Yes. <laughs> So coming back as we started off our conversation talking about the University of Cape Town, uh, this is the campus that I am based at uh, in the Department of uh, Molecular and Cellular Biology. But as Val mentioned, I began my PhD and completed both that and my postdoc uh, at the Institute for Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine under the mentorship of Professor Frank Bombacher. Uh, who is also uh, part of the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. So this is our pretty our, our, our lovely campus before the fire hit us. Um, at the start of this year, we had an awful uh, fire on the slopes of Table Mountain over here, which damaged one of our libraries uh, over here. But thankfully, that was the only damage that we, uh, that we had and the campus is back up and running. So today, what I want to talk to you about is, I'd say, a bit of a forgotten child in, in the adaptive immune response regarding uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis, and this is the, the B cell compartment. And the work that, that we've done um, has indicated or shown that B cells producing IL-4 specifically 
are able to regulate uh, T-helper cell dichotomy, especially uh, during cutaneous leishmaniasis induced by leishmania major. And these studies were performed uh, in a mouse model of infection. Uh, so all the data that I'm going to show you pertains to that. So I'm not gonna to spend too much on this slide. We're all uh, well aware that cutaneous leishmaniasis uh, caused by our major requires a type one and uh, T-helper one immune response to clear infection. But in South Africa, we are not endemic for uh, leishmaniasis. Uh, and in fact, with the big three that we already have, that being HIV, TB, and malaria, it's a disease we do not want. So accessing cl clinical samples uh, is, is fairly difficult in our setting. And for the most part, we focused uh, on the murine model of leishmania major infection. Now you all might be well familiar with this model. It was one of the early models that was established in the 90s. And it's one of those models that actually defined t helper one and t helper 2 for us. So in this model, um, as we know, the parasites are either injected into the foot pad, into the rump, or, to, or into the ear. And the swelling um, is measured weekly as an indication of disease progression. Now we use two models, that being the Bulb C and the C57 black six mice. The reason being uh, the Bulb C uh, resemble or show the susceptible uh, response as can be seen by the increased swelling during the course of infection. And this was found to be due to this T helper two and type two immune response with the predominant cytokines being IL-4 and IL-13 orchestrating the response. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the C57 black six mice and these animals develop a resistant uh, phenotype uh, or healing response. As you can see here, they develop swelling during the early phases of infection and then clear by around six to eight weeks post-infection. And this was shown in the early 90s to be due to a T-HALP1 and uh, type one immune response. And the predominant cytokine here was interleukin-12 and interferon gamma. So our lab focused predominantly on the T helper two and type two response orchestrated by IL-4 and IL-13 to try and understand what about these cytokines might be actually inducing this progressive non-healing response in the host. But to target these two cytokines, we decided to focus on the IL-4 receptor alpha. Now, the IL-4 receptor alpha forms this uh, heterodimeric complex with the gamma comma chain through which IL-4 signals, and this is referred to as the type 1 IL-4 receptor alpha. On the other side, uh, the IL-4 receptor alpha also associates with the IL-13 receptor alpha 1, forming the type 2 complex, and through this complex, IL-4 and IL-13 can signal. Prior to this, there was no signaling cascade identified for IL-13 via the IL-13 receptor alpha-2, but around 2002 to 2005, a signaling cascade for this uh, receptor has been identified since then. So to target IL-4 and IL-13, we decided to look at the, or focus on the IL-4 receptor alpha to, in, to look at downstream signaling functions. So what spiked our interest, uh, further interest in these two uh, cytokines was that once uh, the IL-4 receptor alpha itself was deleted, or the IL-4 for that matter, it actually showed that bulb C mice, which normally develop this susceptible um, non-healing response, transformed into a healer phenotype. And this healing uh, phenotype was associated with a reduced parasite burden at the site of infection, as well as the draining lymph node an impaired uh, type two antibody response, but we also found an IL-4 receptor alpha independent T helper two phenotype. And while this was exciting uh, and interesting at the time, it was also a bit of complex because the IL-4 receptor alpha is expressed ubiquitously on numerous immune cells. So at this point, we couldn't pinpoint which cell signaling these ligands via the IL-4 receptor alpha might be having a protective role. So this prompted further work uh, where we started to look at IL-4 receptor alpha signaling on targeted immune cells. And we focused on innate and adaptive immune cells during our major or our Mexicana infection in uh, BARB-C models. So as you can see from this slide, we've done work with dendritic cells, neutrophils, macrophages, uh, as well as T cells, T regulatory cells, as well as B cells. And from this, we've garnered a host of information um, with these various uh, 
mouse trends, specifically looking at how IL-4 receptor alpha interacts with its ligands and the outcome that this has during disease. And what we found is that there is indeed a hierarchy. Depending on which cell is signaling the IL-4 or the IL-13 via its receptor, there's a difference in the outcome of disease. So it's not a one size fits all approach. So going forward, uh, what I want to talk about uh, in these, uh, in the upcoming slides is IL-4 receptor alpha signaling on B cells specifically. Now what prompted our interest in B cells was this paper by Francis Lund's uh, lab, where they actually showed that two populations of effective B cells actually exist. Uh, and they classified these as BE1 or B effector 1 and BE2 or B effector 2. And what we found um, interestingly was that these two populations could have been likened to our T helper 1 and T helper 2 cells because they were associated with, distinct, with a distinct repertoire of cytokines. So, for example, the BE1 cells made more interferon gamma and IL 12, whilst concomitantly they had low levels of IL 4, IL 6, and IL 2. On the other hand, the BE2 compartment of cells had low interferon gamma, low interleukin 12, but on the other side of the spectrum, they made high IL-4, high IL-6, and high IL-2. So this told us that the B cells as a whole, as we know it, may in fact exist as two independent populations, and there may be a dichotomy that is going on during infection. Now, Francis Lund's lab further expanded on this in 2005 and actually showed that the ability for a B cell to make IL-4 was actually controlled by the IL-4 and the IL-4 receptor alpha. So if you perhaps had IL-4 being produced by t 2 cells, this IL-4 can act on B cells via its surface IL-4 receptor alpha to induce IL-4 transcription and expression. And this IL-4 that is being produced by the B cell could act in an autocrine loop to signal the very same cell or perhaps act in a paracrine manner to signal other cells. Francis Lund's lab didn't end there. They went further to actually show that the interferon gamma being produced by B cells was in fact controlled by interferon gamma, to name one of the cytokines, TBET and the interferon gamma receptor. And a very similar mechanism was found. Uh, T-helper one derived interferon gamma could signal the B cell via the interferon gamma receptor. Um, and this activates TBET for transcription of interferon gamma and um, interferon gamma secretion. And again, this interferon gamma can act in an autocrine manner to signal the B cell, whilst at the same time, you could have IL-12 being secreted by maybe dendritic cells or macrophages that also act on the B cell in a paracrine manner to induce activation, further activation of interferon gamma. So in a nutshell, uh, this told us that the, that during infection, perhaps if you had a predominance of BE1 or BE2, you might alter the outcome of disease. But although this, these studies were done in between 2000 and 2005, like I said, these cells still remained the neglected child uh, in cutaneous leishmaniasis. And it wasn't until 2008 that Pascal Lorna's lab actually showed that B cells uh, contribute to susceptibility to L major infection in, in Bob Zemas. And what the author Catherine Ronette here showed was that uh, when she infected a Bob Z UMT mice, and these mice don't have B cells, they actually developed a somewhat of a healing response or intermediate to that of the Bob Z and the C57 black like 6 mice, which control. Uh, in parallel, she also found that parasite burden upon infection with Leishmania major RB39 in UMT mice was also um, reduced, similar to that of the C57 black 6 mice. Further on, the Balb C uh, UMT mice infected with our major RB39 also made higher levels of interferon gamma compared to that of IL-4, all pointing towards this moderately resistant phenotype. If she then took Balb C, um, if she then took Balb C UMT mice and transferred into them B cells, it actually restored the susceptible phenotype to that, similar to that of the Balb C mice. So again, altogether pointing to the fact that B cells could in fact play a role in susceptibility to cutaneous leishmaniasis in mice caused by leishmania major. 
So taking this further, we now wanted to look at the BE2 compartment of B cells uh, with the hypothesis that if BE2 could be likened to our T helper 2, then perhaps BE2 cells contribute to susceptibility during cutaneous leishmaniasis in mice. So to do this, the first thing we wanted to do was to create uh, bulb C mice with a deficiency of the IL-4 receptor alpha on B cells. And to do this, we used the cre loxp system. And in this system, transgenic cre mice, uh, and in this case, expressing MB1 cre, is crossed with bulb C mice with a global deficiency of the IL-4 receptor alpha on all hematopoietic cells. Now, the reason we used MB1 CRE as a promoter to drive CRE mediated deletion is because MB1 CRE is expressed as early on as the pre uh, the pro B cell stage. So we can be we can ensure that deletion of the receptor is occurring very early on during B cell development. Now, the CRE LOX P system was uh, pioneered by Professor Frank Baumbacher, my PhD mentor at the University of Cape Town. Uh, and once these animals are crossed, the progeny uh, are then crossed with bulb mice that contain um, the IL-4 receptor alpha uh, flux. Following this, this gives us bulb mice with the deficiency uh, of the IL-4 receptor alpha on B cells wherever MB1 cre is expressed. Whereas wherever MB1 is not expressed on other cells, say for example, your dendritic cells, macrophages, T cells, the IL-4 receptor alpha is uh, expressed normally. And we termed these animals MB1 Cree, IL4 receptor alpha, minus lox, and bear in mind, they're all on the biopsy background. So the first thing we went on to do following this is to characterize uh, expression and to confirm that we actually did in fact have deletion of the receptor on B cells. So shown here is our population of uh, CD19 or B20 positive B cells. And as you can see here, the IL-4 receptor alpha minus locks, which represents our wild type animals. So these animals would have sufficient expression of the IL-4 receptor alpha on B cells. Uh, as you can see from these histogram plots, um, they do indeed have expression. Whereas the global IL-4 receptor alpha knockout mice shifts together with that of the MB1 cre. The global IL-4 receptor alpha knockout mice, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these are animals that don't have the IL-4 receptor alpha on all hematopoietic cells. So that would include our B cells. So we expected to see uh, this deficiency on those cells as well. On the other hand, if you look at other populations such as your T cells, CD4s, CD8s, uh, NK cells, you find that you have sufficient expression of the IL-4 receptor alpha on these cells. This characterization um, was performed on naive cells. So we wanted to then further confirm that this deletion remains sufficient during Lishmania major infection. And so we looked in the popliteal lymph node at eight weeks post infection. And here again, you note that the uh, expression of the IL-4 receptor alpha is deficient in the MB1 CRE as well as the global IL-4 receptor alpha, whereas IL-4 receptor alpha minus locks or our wild type controls have sufficient expression of the receptor on B cells. So going forward, we were comfortable that uh, we do have a cell-specific deficiency of the IL-4 receptor alpha on B cells, and we're happy to continue looking at the immune response. So the first piece of data that we found was very, very exciting. And in comparison to the bulb C mice, which developed progressive uh, lesions during the course of infection, the MB1 CRE animals developed a healing phenotype very similar to that of the C57 black six mice. Importantly, these animals also showed, um, did not show any levels of necrosis, unlike those of the Bob C mice. When we then went further to look at the parasite burdens, again, we found that the MB1 CRE IL4 receptor alpha knockout mice exhibited a parasite control uh, in the foot pad, uh, whereas we didn't see parasite control in the draining lymph node. And we confirmed these infections both in Lishmania major RPP1-9, as well as the more virulent Lishmania major IL-81 strain. This was short term where the animals were sacrificed at week eight post infection. And we wanted to now see whether this control also extended into chronic phase. 
and we maintained infection uh, for 40 weeks uh, post parasite inoculation. And as you can see in this slide, the MB1 pre animals um, still maintained parasite, uh, oh, sorry, um, the healing phenotype at the site of infection, similar to that of our C57 black six animals. We then wanted to now look at the impact that this might have on the T cells. And so we specifically looked at the uh, interferon gamma as well as IL-4 and IL-13 response. And we analyzed this via ELISA uh, in popliteal lymph nodes that was stim stimulated with anti-CD3 or Leishmania antigen. And what we found was that the MB1 CRE exhibited an increase in inter interferon gamma um, and a strong uh, dramatic decrease in both interleukin-4 as well as interleukin-13. So as I just mentioned in the previous slide, this was total lymph node cells that were being stimulated. And now we wanted to see, well, how is this directly affecting the T cells? And so uh, we went further to do a co-culture assay uh, with T cells and APCs and antigen. And here again, we found that the interferon gamma secretion by T cells was increased in MB1 pre mice, but we had a strong, a very strong reduction in the T helper 2 cytokines, uh, that being IL-4, IL-13, as well as IL-10 in the MB1 pre animals. So from this, we could see that the absence of the IL-4 receptor alpha response of B cells was actually tipping uh, T cell, CD4 T cell dichotomy, where we were seeing a switch from detrimental T helper 2 to a beneficial T helper 1 response already. Next, we wanted to see if the impact of the deletion of the receptor on B cells also extended to the humoral antibody response, because we were well aware that IL-4 is in fact needed for class switching of the B cells uh, to IgG1 and IgE. So we wanted to check that this was in fact um, affected. And what we found was that the MB1 Cree animals, uh, again, had a drastic reduction in IgE as well as IgG1, but an increase in antigen-specific IgG2B. So again, we were seeing that we have this immunoglobulin class switching being tipped, uh, where class switching to IgG1 and IgE is impaired, and you instead have this more beneficial type one humoral immune response that is predominating. We then wanted to further look at, well, if we having parasite control, how are the, how are the parasites actually being eliminated uh, in the host during infection? And around the same time, we were interested in inos producing DCs or classical activation of dendritic cells as, a, as an alternate mechanism for parasite control during cutaneous leishmaniasis in the murine host. And so we looked for the expression of IL-12 as well as inos in DCs. And we actually found that the mb one pre animals actually showed uh, elevated IL-12 secretion by dendritic cells and increased INOS by these dendritic cells as well. So by that, we, we could see that the absence of the receptor on B cells was actually tipping the killing effective functions into a beneficial response in the dendritic cells. And this also extended to macrophages, uh, where we found that classically activated macrophages in the MB1 pre animals were increased, uh, whereas alternately activated macrophages or M2 was drastically reduced. So all in all, uh, we've got increased IL-12 and INOS uh, in digitic cells and a shift to an M1 phenotype in the absence of IL-4 receptor alpha positive B cells. So from the, from this part of the data, we were able to conclude that the impairment of the IL-4 receptor alpha on B cells in biopsia mice enhances a protective immune response, not just on the T cells, but also in B cells and DC function to this overall beneficial response in the murine model. But what we thought about next, well, what is the underlying mechanism? Sure, we've taken out the receptor on, on the B cell, but what about that could actually be responsible for the immune response that we were seeing? 
So we went back to the textbooks uh, and just thought about, well, what are B cells important for? Uh, what are they the poster child for? And the main things that come to mind is their uh, ability to produce antibodies, their ability to present antigens in the germinal center, and their ability to produce cytokines. So we decided to look at each of these um, functions in a little bit more detail to see if we could pinpoint one of these as the mechanism uh, for the response that we were seeing once the receptor has been deleted. When it came to the antibody production, however, we didn't uh, follow this up too closely because it was unlikely that the mechanism based on the work by Catherine Burnett in 2008, where she already showed that if you transfer specific antibodies post-infection, it did not, does not promote uh, the expression of a susceptible phenotype in UMT mice. And it didn't matter whether you added serum uh, before infection or after infection. So whether she used serum at day seven or day 14 post-infection, it still didn't alter the response. Hence, for this reason, we didn't follow antibody production um, too closely. So that took us now to antigen presentation as the next uh, possible mechanism. So here, very crudely, we first looked at the expression of MHC class two uh, on our B cells uh, during infection. And we found no differences in the expression of uh, MHC class two uh, on the surface of the B cells. But we wanted to take this further and actually look at, well, how are these B cells actually priming um, or inducing activation in naive T cells. And so here we did a co-culture system where we co-cultured the L major primed B cells with some naive T cells and Ishmanian antigen and looked at the activation profile of these uh, T cells after three days. And what we found was that um, the deficiency of the IL-4 receptor alpha marginally, uh, as you can see in, in this image here, marginally improved B cell antigen presentation to the T cells. So that covered us for antigen presentation, but still it wasn't a strong enough uh, response for us to denote this as the mechanism. And so we went now to look at the last aspect uh, of B cell function, and this is ability to make cytokines. But what we were interested in is not just the ability of B cells to make cytokines during the acute phase of infection, so say eight weeks post infection, but also were these B cells able to make cytokines during the early phases of infection? And why we were interested in this is because we knew from literature that the T cells being the poster child for uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis do make cytokines as early as day one post infection. And so if we were thinking that B cells also exhibit a dichotomy like, um, like T cells, could they be also showing early cytokine production as early as day one post-infection? So the first thing we confirmed was the cytokine production in week eight post-infection uh, during the acute phase where we had control of uh, for pet swelling and parasite burden at this point in time. And here we see that the MB1 Cree animals uh, have a strongly uh, reduced IL-4, IL-13 and IL-10 response on, their, on the B cells. But like I said, this was uh, at the week eight post-infection. So further into the infection where the immune response has decided already which way it wants to go. And that is what we're seeing. So we wanted to look early on. So we infected animals and isolated uh, B cells from the draining lymph node at day one, day two, and day three post-infection. And we were very, very excited to see that as early as day one post-infection, B cells uh, in, um, as early as day one and day two post-infection, sorry, B cells in the MB1 cream mice were already uh, making interferon gamma, whereas this was not seen in the, um, or seen to a much lower extent in the IL-4 receptor alpha, minus LOX R wild type controls. Um, in parallel to that, the wild type mass instead made high levels of interleukin-4 as early as day one post-infection with peak levels at day two post-infection. So by this data, we were already seeing that there's a star-regulated BE2, B effector 2 response, and an up-regulated B effector 1 cytokine response in the absence of IL-4 receptor alpha positive B cells. And this was occurring as early as day one to day three post-infection. 
Now, why we found this very, very exciting is because if we think about the textbook knowledge, if we think about how innate immunity and how adaptive immunity is meant to work, we're taught or as immunologists early on that your innate immunity is going to kick in for the first uh, three days and only then your adaptive immune response is going to kick in. And your, your B cells need time uh, by the time, in the time that they reach the germinal center to start making uh, cytokines and uh, show an effective response. But here we were seeing that as early as day one and day two post-infection, 24 hours post the infection, we were already seeing these B cells being activated and secreting uh, cytokines. So this was very exciting for us. Um, so just to summarize what I've shown so far, the deficiency of the receptor on B cells slightly improved the proliferation or the activation of the vector CD4 T cells. But also the alpha receptor alpha deficient B cells show a BE1 phenotype, whereas alpha receptor alpha responsive B cells, which would be the case in our wild type mice, show a predominantly BE2 phenotype. So the next question or the last thing we wanted uh, to ask is, well, if this is the case, if uh, IL-4 receptor alpha responsive B cells are showing a BE2 phenotype, is it in fact the B cell derived IL-4 and IL-13 from these BE2 cells that are inducing disease uh, during cutaneous leishmaniasis in the immune host? And so to answer this question, uh, we went on to create chimeric mice with the deficiency of the IL-4 uh, specifically on B cells. So we created um, the chimixed uh, chimeric mice using a 50 to 50 ratio. Uh, and we also created, uh, not only did we create mice with a deficiency of the IL-4 on B cells, we also created mice with a deficiency of the IL-13 on B cells, given our interest in the IL-4 receptor as a whole uh, and included our um, UMT animals as controls, as well as the wild type, and the C57 black six mice as a, as a controller. Uh, after eight weeks of reconstitution, um, we infected these animals with Schmania major and monitored infection for eight weeks. And the results were very, very, very exciting. What we found was that in the absence of IL-4 production on B cells, the animals actually displayed moderate resistance to Leishmania major over the course of infection, significantly different to that of our wild type animals. And I say moderate because here we have our C57 black six mice, which as you can see by the BIL4 uh, chimeric mice, the black six mice still exhibit a stronger uh, resistance than that of our BIL4 chimeric mice. So, from this, we were able to, to conclude that the absence, it is in fact the absence of B-cell derived IL-4 that triggers a host protective immune response to cutaneous leishmaniasis in the murine host. To, um, to further confirm the phenotype, we went on to look at parasite burdens uh, in the foot pad, as well as the lymph node. And in both instances, we found a significant reduction in the parasite burden in the BIL-4 uh, chimeric mice, in the foot pad, as well as the draining lymph node. We went on further to look at the T, T helper response. And again, here we see that the BIL-4 chimeric mice had an increase in interferon gamma, but there's a very strong decrease in IL-4 as well as IL-13 um, in this instance. Uh, lastly, we went on to look at the expression of the uh, cytokines via qPCR. And again, similar to our uh, ELISA data, we found that the BIL4 chimeric mice had increased interferon gamma and almost no levels of IL4 13 and very low levels of uh, no levels of IL4 and very low levels of IL13. Taking it further, we wanted to confirm the humoral immune response. And similar to that, which we saw in the MB1 Cree animals, in the absence of IL-4 on B cells, uh, we didn't have class switching going on. So we had a strong reduction in IgE, but an upregulation in uh, IgG2A or the type one humoral immune response. Interestingly, uh, even though the IL-4 receptor as a whole was contributing, as we saw in the earlier slides, to control or to susceptibility when present, 
the ability of B cell derived uh, cytokines to modulate the outcome of cutaneous leishmaniasis, specifically the susceptible response, was restricted to IL, the B cells making IL 4. Because when we removed uh, IL 13 or, or impaired the ability of B cells to make IL 13, it did not change uh, the disease phenotype. So B IL 13 chimeric mice were still as susceptible to infection as other wild type mice in contrast to, the, to those animals with the deficiency of the IL-4 on B cells. So from, from this work, uh, we were able to overall conclude that the impairment of this receptor or the signaling cascade on B cells drives uh, early interferon gamma in B cells, which leads to a protective um, type one immune response, sorry, this should be type two here. Uh, and therefore, um, so let's move all of this. And therefore the BE2 cells, uh, as we know them, are detrimental in cutaneous leishmaniasis, whereas the BE1 appears to be beneficial uh, during cutaneous leishmaniasis. So, there are still a few questions that, that need to be answered in terms of the mechanism or how the B cell might be entering uh, the germinal center to, to induce this early activation. But what we think is that when the B cell encounters the antigen in the periphery, it migrates to the germinal center and it is able to secrete IL-4 in the setting that it finds itself, uh, the antigen itself uh, interacts with an IL T cell, and from the IL-4 that it secretes, so it could also act in a paracrine manner to the IL-4 by the IL-4 receptor alpha on a naive T cell uh, to induce T helper two cells and continue the, the cascade. So some of the mechanisms that could come into play here, well, which still needs to be answered, but specifically where our thoughts are going on this is that we know that the T cell cannot see the antigen on its own. It's blind without the help of antigen presentation by an antigen presenting cell, which could either be a B cell or a dendritic cell or macrophages as the textbook knowledge tells us. But we know that B cells are also antigen presenters and by their natural uh, BCR is able to interact with the antigen very early after infection. And therefore could be not just acting as a bystander cell, but as an active participant very early on in infection migrating to the germinal center and activating the, the T cells there. Um, we, what we don't know yet is if there are any specific Leishmania peptides uh, that activate the B cells for these specific um, cytokine profiles for the BE1 and BE2, and that's for the work that, that needs to, to be looked at. And just like I mentioned, how much of this activation depends on the BCR versus pathogen recognition receptors on the surface of the, of the B cell. Um, so to end, I'd just like to acknowledge the research team that was involved in this, in this uh, work, um, as well as our genotyping and animal facility team at the University of Cape Town, and of course our funders. And thank you for the opportunity to present this work, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Ramona, for, for an excellent presentation. Um, because we still have uh, a few minutes, about 20 minutes before the next talk, I think we could have a few questions at this moment before the round table at the end. This way we keep on to the schedule. So. Uh, and wants to ask Ramona right now to the chat and I'll transfer it to her or else any of you guys that are here with us in this room can also can also ask questions. I, I would say that a couple of questions will do it uh, until we are able to move to the next one. Sure. I think it's quite interesting that uh, to see a, a particular role for B cells in terms of immunoregulation. Anytime we think of B cells, yeah. whether B1 or B2 cells, we think of uh, antibody production at most, exactly. antigen presentation. Exactly. But it's really striking how they can influence 
the micro environment response. and completely Absolutely. change the profile the of the response. Okay. Yes, indeed. I I have a, a oh. I have a, a quick question. Thank you. That was very, uh, very nice, uh, Ramona. The um, in, in terms of the longevity, longevity of the cytokine producing B cells, do we have a good feeling for um, what their half life is like? And, and once you have a recruitment of a high cytokine producing B cell, will it generate memory cells that produce that profile of uh, cytokines? And how long will their role be? Or do they die out fairly quick? And then uh, so I guess I'm asking about the initiation phase and then a, a, a longer phase down the road. Uh, Ken, that's, that's a very, very good question. In this study, I didn't look at the, the memory B cells making the cytokine state later on. But what I can tell you is when we did the cytokine profile, when we looked at the B cells, we also looked at the T cells at the same time. And while you do see a dichotomy, the quantity of the cytokines expressed in the T cell is much more versus that okay. of the B cell. So it's like, I would almost think it's like one shot hit and it just gives this burst burst off. But the fact, yeah. yes, but the fact that we see it at day one and then it continues during um, week eight, during the acute phase, tells me that it's continual. I didn't, we didn't look at chronic phase, whether we also had uh, the, the cytokines going on there. But based on the quantities itself, the, the T cell is still the more copious producer. Uh, but the fact that this B cell is hitting it also at day one um, is could be what is driving part of that response, considering that it can see that antigen even because the T cell has to wait for that APC to come along. Thank you. I have a question too. Very, very nice talk, Ramona. Thank you very much. I would like to know, uh, what do you think about the role of regulatory B cells in this context, the production of IL-10 with IL-4? Very, very interesting question, Claudia, because we almost expected that IL-10 should also be driving part of this response. Uh, and when we looked at the IL-10 levels in the MB1 pre, we also saw that it was, it was downregulated. So we continued also looking at IL-10 throughout the infection. But when we did the chimeric mice and we looked at the levels of IL-10, they were unchanged in BIL-4. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, again, a bit against the dogma because we expected that regulatory B cell expressing IL-4 might actually be playing um, a huge role. And if you, if you were modulating BE1 and BE2, you might then be modulating the, the compartment of the regulatory B cell. But on the, be that as it may, uh, Harris, when he also published the BE1 and BE2 profile, he also didn't find a difference in IL-10. They were actually equivalent be between mm -hmm. them. So I definitely think there's still some work that needs to be done with the regulatory B-cell compartment because when you modulate the B-cell as a whole, you do see changes in IL-10. But now mm -hmm. when you go specifically to BE1 and BE2, you don't, you don't see this. So there's some dysregulation or some regulation going going on between uh, the two. It could be interesting to see it, uh, VL, no, these are all ishmanizers in the spleen. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 one of our ongoing uh, projects as yeah. well, to now look because B cells have also been now implicated in in VL, so it would be interesting to yeah. see what yeah. the response is there. And since IL10 is all that much more pronounced and important in that yeah. infection, mm. sure. So maybe yeah. next conference, I'll have something on that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and here in Brazil or in the South. Oh, Africa. yes, yes. So yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Great. So Ramona, it's very, it's really, like I said, very interesting that, uh, that the B cell really can contribute so much for the initial environment that will drive mm the resistant uh, profile in your mice. Uh, one thing that I was wondering is whether this change in the microenvironment activation of the T cells would also have an influence on the types of cells that you recruit to the lesion site. So for example, in your, uh, in your deficient mice, uh, you still get some inflammation and is the composition of the cells that go there, are the types of cells that are going there different than the cells that go in the wild type? So does it also influence the migration of different cell types to your lesion? 
So what we found was that the frequency, so we didn't look at in the actual lesion, um, we looked at the draining lymph node to see what was the cell infiltration going on there. So while we didn't see, uh, so we didn't, to be honest, we didn't see much changes in the frequency or in the absolute numbers of the, of the population of cells infiltrating. It was more the ability of these cells to, like we saw the cytokines, and the effect on the humoral re immune response rather than the influx of CD8, CD4, dendritic cells, uh, macrophages. But it was the effective function and predominantly the ability of these cells to make specific cytokines, like the IL-12 on the DCs, the INOS, um, the IL-4, IL-13 T cells, and B cells at the same time. Yeah. Okay, Paul wants to ask a question, Paul? Yeah, hi, Rana. Apologies, uh, apologies, I missed the first few minutes of your presentation. Um, That's okay. It's not, it's so you nice may, to you see may you. have already addressed this. Great, great to hear what you're doing. Um, but when I used to do some stuff with Frank a while ago, you know, there was always it's, these thoughts of early IL-4 being required for preconditioning of, of IL-12 yes. production from DC. Mm -hmm. So are, are you now suggesting that that's a, a B cell rather than an ILC source for IL-4? Uh, you know, the, the, the dendritic cell instruction with that, with that IL-4, there's always the question of where was that IL-4 coming from to induce those dendritic cells early on. And when uh, the initial papers came out showing IL-4 mediated DC instruction, they were postulating it was perhaps the innate cells that were making some of this, this IL-4. But this was before we had done the, the B cell work. So we, we, it's possible that if this is the case, uh, because the B cell being able to see the antigen directly and the dendritic cell is also seeing the antigen and, and interacting with it, perhaps this IL-4 is coming from an adaptive cell as opposed to an innate cell as we initially thought. But that's just a theory right now. We haven't, um, haven't tested it. Yeah. I mean, there might be some anatomical complexities there that you would have to, to work around. Yes. Oh, yeah, Great. indeed. Fantastic. Anyway, give my best to Frank as well. We'll do so. Nice to see you, Paul. If anyone else uh, has any questions, I have a question. I, I think yes, think Herbert has one. Yes, yes. Hamona, congratulations for your talk. Fantastically beautiful, beautiful work. Thank so, you. I have a question that I'm suffering the same. So, when we look for bulbs mice, we have a huge expansion of B cells. But when we look at B six mice, we don't have so. We are trying to understand some of these aspects. What do you think about if you look at B6 mice using IO4 receptor knockout mice? Do you think, you know, the, the level of the impact on that we have in, in BALBC is high than B6? What do you think the role of B cells looking for B6 mice? What do you think? Very interesting question. So we haven't looked at, I haven't looked specifically at the B cell compartment in the IL-4 receptor alpha division mice on, on a black six background. Um, what, what you're saying, Herbert, when you're looking at the population, are you looking during the acute phase and you're seeing this? Yeah, we are looking several time, and time points, but mm. if you look in chronic phase comparing mm. <clears throat> BAL BC and the B6, is when we infect here, the beginning infections could be very similar. And then yes. B6 can start to control and Bob C, Bob C keeps growing. growing. So if you look in this time point where you have similar lesions, mm -hmm. we have a huge amount of B cells on Bob C and we don't have on B6. So there is a point of expansion of B cells that's high. So if you think in, in the beginning of Bob C in the B6 and we yeah. have more IO4 on Bob C and not, so maybe yeah. this huge expansions point, yes. yes could yeah. mm. so could mm. be and uh, if you yeah. if you could have this that's a good point yeah that's a, that's a good point because we know that both Bob C and Black Six are actually making IL4 early on but the fact like you're saying you may have more B cells in the Bob C mice there's more IL4 being coming and skewing the response over there as opposed to the to the Black Six. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Okay, that's fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Ramona. Nathan. Thank you for being uh, here with I us. I think Nathan was Thank you. Nathan? Nathan. Yes. Sorry, Nathan, I didn't see your... Oh, that's, yes, that's, please, go ahead, Nathan. That's okay. Um, thank you, Ramona. Really, really nice talk and really an excellent set of, uh, of um, a specific knockout knockout mice so just a kind of a kind of a mundane and maybe predictable predictable question um in terms of this this very early il4 response mm -hmm. um, in the adaptive compartment um you know obviously antigen availability is a big driver and i'm, I'm just wondering when you see these early responses which i think we're in the draining lymph node the, yes. the dose of parasite that you're that you're mm -hmm. using here um, mm -hmm. in, in, in these studies? Um, so to induce disease, we're, since we're doing the foot pad model, we use two million parasites. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm just wondering under those conditions, if, if you're delivering you know, free antigen into the draining lymph node very, very quickly, that you might not, mm -hmm. that you might not see. Um, in the normal, in the state, in, yeah. In, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a clinical yeah. state. Mm. in a lower dose where, you know, the, mm. you know, the, the parasite, I always say Lashmania's first line of defense is antigen sequestration, you know, it tries mm. to mm. hide as quickly as, hide, it can. as quickly as it possibly um, can. Yeah. And so maybe, you know, with those higher doses, mm. maybe you're changing that, mm. that kinetic, um, yeah, I, and sort I, of I overlapping the yeah. innate and adaptive responses mm. kind of at the same time, whereas mm. that mm. might be more separated with a, yeah. um, with a lower I think, dose. Well, yeah. so just curious that, that about that. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. And I think one of the ways we could answer that is perhaps to use the ear, ear model of infection where we give a much lower uh, dose, more physiologically relevant. Um, and that sometimes is a thousand to 10,000 parasites in the ear. And then look at the draining lymph node there to see if the B cells are still, uh, oh, this response is still induced with that lower dose compared to the foot pad model. Thanks, yeah. that's, that's an yeah. interesting one to follow. Yeah. Thank you, Nathan. Re really nice talk, thank you. Thank you. Fantastic, excellent discussion. Thank you, thank, thank everybody for the comments and thank you Ramona so much. It was thank very, you, Mal. thanks everybody. Very nice and, and interesting talk and very, very, um, very creative as well, very different in the way we think of uh, making us think of these cells as a very important mm -hmm. source of uh, of immunoregulatory molecules, which, which as we know, is, is really key for developing protective response, but also for developing pathology. And mm. I think that's what we are going to hear from now on with uh, the presentation yeah. of the next of the next speaker, Absolutely. Who, um, who I'd like to introduce. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Ken Golub as the speaker uh, for the next talk. Ken uh, did his PhD uh, at the University of Colorado Health Science Center, uh, working on a tolerance under the uh, uh, coordination of Dr. Ed Palmer. And then he did a postdoc with Bob Kaufman at the next research institute. And he probably had very good memories watching Ramona's talk because he worked quite a bit on the importance of uh, IL-4 and different sources of IL-4 in the development of a TH2 response. So he probably had good memories of, uh, of his yeah. postdoc years, listening to Ramona's talk. And we and, didn't think of these cells. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Ken then, uh, after his postdoc, he came to Brazil and he brought his experience and expertise in immunoregulation and T-cell responses uh, to the setting of human diseases particularly leishmaniasis, and he very early on engaged in a collaboration with Edgar Carvalho's group in Bahia, uh, and uh, he's been studying several different aspects of, uh, of leishmaniasis uh, here in Brazil and other diseases. He's currently a researcher at the Hospital Israelita Albert Einstein in Sao Paulo, where he's been focusing a lot on cancer research but as you will see, he also has been uh, continuing his studies in uh, parasitic diseases, particularly leishmaniasis. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have Ken here with us this afternoon. So Ken, thank you very much for, for being with us and uh, you, you take it from, from here. Thank you. 
So uh, thanks a lot, Val, for the for the nice uh, introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers, of course, uh, Danielle and Herbert, uh, for the opportunity to share with you guys today uh, some of our work in uh, human leishmaniasis. Uh, let me pull the screen up here and try to. And Perfect. we have the yeah. okay, great. Yes, you're good. So, um, yeah, as Val mentioned, uh, today I'll I'll be sharing with you some of our work on looking at immune mechanisms behind disease pathology and therapeutic failure in human tegumentary leishmaniasis. And also, as she mentioned, uh, I came to Brazil for the first time in 1994, and uh, I had met Edgar uh, in uh, Palo Alto in 1993, uh, or 92, I think, uh, on one of his trips to Bob's lab. So uh, Bob Kaufman was working with TH1, TH2 development in the mouse model of leishmaniasis, and uh, Edgar and Bob already knew each other, uh, and I met him at that point and uh, ended up getting down to Brazil and we started uh, uh, collaborating in this, uh, in this area uh, several, several years ago. As Val mentioned, I'm currently uh, recently moved to Albert Einstein uh, uh, Hospital in Sao Paulo and uh, we have a new um, uh, research and education center that will be ready in December. We'll move all the labs over there. It has a medical school, nursing school, physical therapy school, uh, all in the same space along with the Innovation Center at Einstein and the uh, Research Center. So it'll be a, a, a nice environment. And of course, uh, Einstein does research across all areas of, uh, of uh, diseases, uh, including infectious diseases, cancer, and autoimmune diseases. Let me get my laser pointer here. So uh, just a brief overview, I'm going to speak some a little bit first about uh, overall aspects of uh, tegumentary leishmaniasis and immunoregulation, uh, some of our uh, findings in mucosal leishmaniasis, and then move on to uh, cutaneous uh, leishmaniasis. So uh, we've been working in uh, uh, Bahia, Corte de Pedra, uh, endemic area, as I mentioned with Edgar Carvalho in the group. And uh, this, this health post has been uh, established now around 30 years ago uh, by Dr. Edgar Carvalho and the group uh, at UFPA. And he has been maintaining this, um, this area, uh, with, uh, which not only services uh, uh, patients with leishmaniasis, but other uh, health conditions. And there's around 1,000 patients per year uh, that arrive at this uh, uh, health post most with leishmaniasis, with leishmania brasiliensis infection. Um, and it serves as an excellent uh, 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 area for us to be able to try and do some studies that can benefit the population. So human tegumentary leishmaniasis, uh, we're, when we think about the disease as a whole, um, we have to remember the sand fly infection. Uh, again, leishmania brasiliensis uh, is the principal uh, leishmania type in this area. Um, during the early phases of the disease, uh, we have the lymphadenopathy uh, from draining lymph nodes. It then forms a papilla, uh, which then progresses to uh, an ulcerated lesion, and that can um, lead the patient to seek out uh, medical care. In the endemic area, people are uh, well informed about leishmaniasis, and actually at the palpula stage, they can already uh, uh, appear at the, at the health clinic. And these patients are treated with pentavalent antimony. Um, which can either lead to a good response and healing after one course, but around 50% require more than one course of antimony. And uh, as you all know, antimony has some toxicity issues. Um, these patients also have a DTH positive response. And when you have refractory disease, um, it takes several more courses of the antimony, which again uh, can increase chances of toxicity issues. So any research we can do in understanding uh, what is behind the failure of response and what we can do possibly to increase uh, responsiveness and allow a decrease in the dose of pentavalent antimony would all be things that would be beneficial uh, for the patients. And then there's mucosal leishmaniasis, which uh, develops months or years after uh, uh, a cutaneous disease. And this leads to um, destructive lesions 
that can often relapse and also are non-responsive to antimony treatment. And this, this, this extensive tissue destruction is associated with a very strong uh, cellular response and DTH response. So our studies over the years have really uh, focused on defining immune mechanisms and also looking for biomarkers of this disease pathology, the disease severity and uh, therapeutic failure. So when we talk about immune regulation of uh, uh, human leishmaniasis and particularly CD4 T cells, um, we have to remember all the different uh, subtypes that are involved and the dynamics of the situation. Um, so thinking of a CD4 positive T cell that will differentiate into one of the many functional subsets, this will depend on the uh, cytokine balance in the microenvironment. And we know there are many different cell types that will influence this microenvironment from macrophages, dendritic cells, and of course, uh, B cells, as were uh, uh, highlighted in our previous talk. So depending on the balance of these, uh, this cytokine microenvironment, as a major factor, we will drive differentiation of these functionally distinct uh, cell populations. And again, it's important to remember that these populations, um, while some of them have more extreme polarized states themselves, will often have a balance of different cell types present in the microenvironment. And then this balance, uh, together with a macrophage here in the middle for leishmaniasis, we will lead to either an inflammatory response that leads to protection, but also has the potential to lead to pathology. And we'll discuss more about this, uh, the dynamics in this concept that depending on when we're looking at disease, we may have a more protective role for a, for a biased TH1 inflammatory response or a more pathologic uh, role. Uh, and then on the other side, we have down regulatory responses that can help counterbalance this inflammation and the pathology. And of course, this balance is critical not to allow uh, outgrowth of leishmania in an uncontrolled manner. Um, in addition to the, the regulation by cytokines from CD4 T cells, we also have macrophage polarized towards M1 type macrophages and M2. David Moser's talked the other day, um, of course, that he's a, a key researcher in that area of uh, the early studies defining M1 and M2 macrophages. In addition, we have many other cell types that also have both effector functions and cytokine regulatory functions. And we can think of CD8 cells in the terms of uh, cytolytic CD8 positive T cells, also TC1 type cells that produce cytokines with less cytolytic granules, CD8 suppressor cells. We have double negative T cells, which we've done a lot of work on in uh, leishmaniasis, which are a key producer of inflammatory and IL-10. Um, these cells are interesting in the sense that they recognize antigen on non-classic uh, MHC type 1 uh, molecules. These, uh, these CD1 molecules, A, B, C, or D, uh, they have a very uh, uh, distinct antigen binding cleft, which is different from class 1 in that it's shallow and more well suited for binding lipids and glycolipids. So the presentation of these antigens uh, also leads to either a more inflammatory profile, double negative T cells, or regulatory profile, uh, double negative T cells. And lastly, uh, just calling attention to NK cells, which can be critical sources of early interferon gamma and TNF, which can also have an influence on polarizing uh, immune responses. That was shown early in early years in uh, the mouse models of leishmania by Bob Kaufman's group. So our studies um, working with patients from the endemic area uh, have kind of this, this general uh, uh, study design where we uh, volunteer patients uh, agree to provide uh, a, a tube of whole blood that we'll use for looking at uh, separating into plasma or PBMCs. And with the plasma, we can look at soluble uh, cytokines and immune uh, mediators using uh, many different methodologies from Luminex to uh, Legendplex and CBA. They all work by similar uh, principles where you have beads that bind specific cytokines and in fluorescence intensity indicates the amount of uh, that analyte present in the plasma. Uh, we also have whole blood or PBMCs that we use for uh, high dimensional flow cytometry or multicolor flow cytometry for identification of specific cell populations and their uh, functional potential activation state uh, and uh, those sorts of characteristics. Uh, we also have lesion biopsies that we can use for looking at uh, the tissue immune microenvironment and use uh, methodologies like transcriptome to look at uh, 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 gene expression profiles. And of course, all this is tied together with patient data 
uh, ranging from lesion size to response to therapy, DTH response, and other aspects. So um, our uh, early studies from Edgar's group, um, from Olivia Barcelar, uh, really showed one of the key aspects of mucosal disease um, in, in that there's an exacerbated TH1-like response. And this is shown here uh, from plasma uh, from patients with high levels of interferon gamma and TNF-alpha in the mucosal patients compared to cutaneous patients. So this was the uh, key indicator that um, there's an, there could be an exacerbated TH1 type response. Of course, there's many different sources for these cytokines uh, in our uh, immune responses. And here are some studies from uh, Soraya's uh, uh, thesis looking at production of TNF-alpha from CD4 positive T cells in mucosal and cutaneous patients, and also from uh, monocytes. And what uh, she saw was that TNF-alpha was also increased in not only lymphocyte populations, CD4 populations, but also monocytes from the mucosal patients uh, compared to cutaneous patients. So these um, uh, studies, of course, were in the periphery. And when, when um, we focused in on the tissue, these studies were done by Daniela uh, Faria uh, from Val Dutra's group. Um, really focusing in on what is the situation in cutaneous lesions versus mucosal lesions in terms of the balance of interferon gamma uh, in this slide. And you can see that the mucosal lesions uh, presented much higher levels of interferon gamma from CD4 positive T cells and also higher uh, um, total, total interferon gamma and a tendency for an increase in CD8, which wasn't statistically significant in this, in this particular study. And also that was not only for the frequency of cells producing gamma, but also the intensity of uh, interferon gamma production. So this was all pointing to um, this idea that uh, an exacerbated TH1 type response, both systemically and locally, um, may be behind the damage of the tissue damage seen in mucosal disease. And um, Paulo Machado uh, did some definitive uh, clinical trials using pentoxifilin to uh, try and inhibit TNF-alpha uh, activities. Pentoxifilin was an excellent choice for TNF-alpha inhib inhibition because we're dealing with leishmaniasis. So a more strong inhibition of TNF-alpha activities could be risky, right? If we shut that completely down, uh, we could have an ineffective uh, anti-leishmania response. But if we can control the uh, uh, pathologic aspects of, of TNF with something like pentoxifilin, um, which inhibits activities to a lesser extent than uh, uh, antibody inhibitors, we may be able to see a beneficial uh, response. So Paulo did uh, uh, clinical trials, um, which really showed incredibly clearly that uh, pentoxifilin uh, together with antimony led to a dramatic uh, decrease in the time needed for uh, healing of the lesion. And these are, sometimes were progressive lesions that also stopped progressing. Uh, and led to relief for these patients. Uh, Danielle, again, with, uh, uh, um, from, from Val's group, uh, looked in the lesions at the immune response in these patients after treatment of pentox, uh, pentoxifilin with antimony or antimony alone, and saw that the number of cells that were uh, TNF-alpha producing macrophages dramatically decreased in the patients after pentoxifilin treatment. And these are the immunofluorescent studies showing the uh, before treatment with antimony and pentoxifilin and after treatment with uh, pentoxifilin and really a dramatic decrease in the presence of uh, macrophages with TNF-alpha. So those studies were very clear for the role of uh, an exacerbated immune response in the pathology and mucosal disease and how that can lead to a, a novel treatment. That treatment, by the way, is now uh, uh, approved in Envisa. Uh, Edgar Carvalho and uh, uh, Paulo Machado um, or, uh, having, having been able to drive these studies and lead to a uh, NVISA approved treatment is just a spectacular outcome of uh, clinical uh, and translational research. We went on um, to study also the role, po potential role of the immune response in immunopathology and cutaneous disease. And these studies were done uh, really looking at lesion size in patients that were had ulcerated lesions and looking at the systemic immune response again with the idea of being able to look for potential markers in the blood that would predict either um, the severity of disease and also this response to therapy 
an advantage of having a blood marker is that's something that could be much uh, yeah, easier to to identify uh, in in the field uh, and could indicate a potential um, uh, either response to therapy or disease severity. So here, what we have are cutaneous leishmaniasis patients again uh, with whole blood uh, taken. And then uh, we look at a panel of immune markers to uh, cover CD4, CD8 T cells, uh, and many different activation states, memory cells, and functional potential uh, based on cytokine production. We've also done studies focusing on INK T cells and specific uh, V beta, V alpha T cell expressors, which I won't uh, share with you today, so just because of the, uh, uh, the time involved. So when you look ex vivo at uh, uh, the immune response, we saw already a pretty striking correlation between the percentage of activated T cells, specifically CD4 positive, CD69 positive T cells were positively correlated with lesion size. And this is ex vivo with no antigenic stimulation. After SLA uh, stimulation, we also saw a positive correlation between the frequency of lymphocytes producing interferon gamma in lesion size and TNF-alpha in lesion size. These were the earliest studies we did uh, with Liz Antonelli, who was a doctorate student uh, in the lab at the time. And these studies led to several other studies which were performed looking at memory sub subsets and also V-beta specific subsets. And all of these showed the same uh, correlation in several different studies between the frequency of activated cytokine producing cells and lesion area. When we looked in the lesion, uh, and again, this is Daniela Faria. She really became an uh, expert at uh, lesion analysis using confocal microscopy in Vols lab. And she found uh, in, in 2009, after these systemic studies, uh, we went into the lesion aspects and saw that there was a, a, um, a real direct correlation between the number of inflammatory uh, granzyme producing CD8 positive cells and uh, the number of uh, just sorry, sorry, the number of uh, inflammatory cells and the number of granzyme positive CD8 positive cells in cutaneous disease, there was a very strong correlation between the two. Um, and together with a uh, finding that there was also the granzyme positive cells, uh, either with or without CD8 production, um, were much higher in the cutaneous disease than the early cutaneous lesions. So again, this early lesion is what we either call a palpula with the inflamed lymph node and the late disease is the ulcerated disease. So this really showed us that progression of human cutaneous leishmaniasis and the ulcerated lesion was associated with granzyme positive CDA positive T cells. And here we're looking at the uh, confocal microscopy in the early disease and then the uh, cutaneous disease or the late disease. So in summary, um, these, these findings um, really paint a picture for us of an exacerbated inflammatory response being important um, and associated with lesion pathology. Uh, in mucosal disease, pentoxifilin uh, can, can inhibit that activity, lead to re, uh, reduction of TNF-alpha activity and the healing of those uh, severe lesions. Uh, Paula went on to do these studies with pentoxifilin and cutaneous disease and didn't see the same dramatic effects um, that were seen in mucosal disease, which is an interesting uh, uh, aspect we can discuss more about later. Um, and with disease severity and lesion severity in cutaneous disease, we have both greater T cell activation associated with the lesion pathology, increased interferon gamma and TNF alpha, and increased CDA positive T cells producing uh, granzyme. So, um, one last point is that the double negative T cell population, uh, in summary, this was work done by Liz Antonelli. Um, while they produced high levels of interferon gamma and TNF alpha, these cells were never uh, correlated with lesion size. So the CD4 positive T cells, CD8 positive T cells producing gamma, TNF, both were related to lesion severity, while double negative T cells were not. So this is an interesting population we still want to do more work on to look at the uh, antigen that is responsible for their activation and their potential as uh, immune activators of macrophages and anti leishmanian responses, but that may not be related to uh, 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 immune pathology. So based on these studies, um, we also were curious about other mechanisms uh, for, for CD8 positive T cells in lesion severity. 
And um, Val and I were talking about this and we decided that it would be nice uh, to share some of these results uh, that were done by Carolyn Koch. She is, uh, Carolina, uh, is a, was a postdoc, was a, a PhD student in Val's lab that we co-advised in these studies uh, um, looking at CD8-mediated toxicity and pathology and leishmaniasis. And today she's a postdoc uh, continuing in, Val lab, in Val's lab in these studies and others. So when we think about CD8 positive T cell mediated cytotoxicity, uh, we really think about the close contact between the CD8 T cell and its target cell. Um, and this leads to activation of the T cell, of course, and release of uh, uh, grand sign perforin and other uh, molecules important for lysing the target. So um, one of the early findings uh, were that CD, uh, CD107 positive ves vesicles in tegumentary lysmoniasis um, were, were related to the disease. And we became uh, curious about looking at this more in more detail in the context of CDA positive T cells. So this is uh, data that was published uh, recently uh, in Frontiers in Immunology. Again, looking at the number of CD8 positive cells and CD107 positive cells associated with the um, progression of, uh, of cutaneous leishmaniasis lesions. And what you can see here is when you look at the number of CD8, CD107 positive cells in early disease and late disease, you see there's a, a dramatic increase in these cells. And you can see um, both at the level of a low magnification where you already have the presence of uh, CD8 positive cells, CD107 positive cells together uh, in, in early disease, but that progresses to a much higher levels in late disease. And then you have mucosal disease. And when you focus in closely, at these uh, lesions, you can see uh, these, these striations. And these striations, again, are DNA, and um, they're extremely reminiscent, of course, of netosis. And um, we decided really to look in more details at, at what are behind these uh, and, and what their relevance may be in cutaneous disease and in CD8 T cell biology. So the first thing that uh, Carl did was to quantify uh, uh, the, the atosis present in early disease, late disease, and mucosal disease. And she saw a progression in the frequency of atosis across the diseased uh, continuum. Then when you go a little further and look at the LETs associated with CD8 positive cells, you again see this progression based on, on severity. And then looking at the percent of CD8 cells in ectosis, so these are CD8 cells that are tied uh, directly to one of those DNA strands, and CD8 cells producing 107 also tied to ectosis, you can see once again that there's a progression from early to late in mucosal disease. So this was a very striking finding that led to um, some more investigation now looking at the percentage of LETs uh, by CD8 positive T cells producing uh, uh, CD107 as well. And this was directly correlated with the inflammatory infiltrate in mucosal disease and late uh, uh, lesions, ulcerated lesions. And this is lost in the early uh, disease. So when you don't have a severe ulcerated lesion, you do not see this correlation between the production of LETs from CD8 positive, CD107 positive cells. Um, and this again reinforces the idea that the frequency of these CD8 positive, 107 positive cells connected to the extracellular DNA is associated with pathologies in the uh, leishmaniasis. So this led to more studies uh, now moving into an in vitro system um, because it was already well known that neutrophils, of course, can produce extracellular traps for killing bacteria. And of course, the, the elegant studies by Elvada's group um, had already shown that nets were most important in leishmaniasis. And from her talk the other day, uh, who had the chance to see that, um, was, was um, uh, also well-defined. And so the question was, can we really uh, uh, go deeper into this definition of the CDA positive T cells releasing these extracellular traps? And if so, are they uh, directly tied to cytolytic vesicles? There had been some earlier studies uh, from uh, Hosha Aheta. Uh, suggesting that CD8 cells could produce extracellular traps. And, and so in the context of leishmaniasis and in the potential that they could deliver cytotoxic signals, uh, these studies were, were designed. 
So uh, Carol set up cultures using PBMCs from healthy individuals to really uh, dig down deeper in the, in the biology behind these uh, potential CD8 derived uh, 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 lets. So using either lymphocyte rich cultures, purified CD4 cells or purified CD8 cells, we did the HCD3 and HCD28 stimulation or in control cultures, necrosis induction by heat. And then the cell populations were either treated or not with DNAs. And then these could be analyzed uh, either by uh, electron microscopy or confocal. And the supernatants could be quantified as well for the presence of, uh, of, of DNA or cytosolic molecules. And the first set of studies was really very striking. Uh, upon anti-CD3, anti-CD28 stimulation, uh, Cato was able to identify these strands uh, connecting cells in the culture. Again, these are total lymphocyte enriched cultures, but stimulated with anti-CD3, CD28, so presumably a, a, a T cell activation signal. And you can see again that these uh, strands were released in this situation. And then looking in the, uh, the, the culture supernatant, you could see that DNAs, uh, first of all, you had a release of uh, DNA into the culture supernatant upon anti-CD3, anti-CD28 stimulation, and DNAs uh, remove that. Um, and compared to necrosis, there was even more uh, uh, DNA released in the, in the situation of anti-CD3, anti-CD28 activation. And here's the quanti quantification of the number of ads per field in the anti-CD3, CD28 stimulated cultures compared to the necrosis. So this really uh, uh, clearly showed that there was some anti-CD3, CD28 induced uh, uh, DNA release that uh, had a, uh, uh, a phenotypic appearance of, of these uh, tight strands. So uh, then Carl went on to perform the electron microscopy studies at the electron microscopy center at OFMJ in, in Belo de Sanche. And what she found here was, was, was even uh, uh, more striking in the sense that media alone, you just saw the uh, very rare events uh, for, for these lymphocyte rich cultures. Upon anti-CD3, CD28 stimulation, you could see these strands uh, appearing. Here in G at a higher magnification, you can see some of these strands. And when you uh, measure those strands, they're consistent with DNA strands. And upon treating with DNAs in panels D, E, and F, uh, those strands disappeared from the cultures. And again, they were highly present in the anti-CD3, CD28 stimulate cultures and not uh, so much in media or, or necrosis induced cultures. And then when you also look at the morphology of the cells uh, upon stimulation, you can see there was a big difference, of course, between uh, media cells, activated cells, and necrotic cells uh, uh, induced by heat. One of the other really uh, uh, interesting findings was that the cells uh, involved in these uh, uh, DNA release, you saw polarization of organelles to one side of the cell, which is very reminiscent of what is seen with neutrophil uh, 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 betosis in terms of this polarization of the uh, organelles. So one of the doubts that we had were, and one of the things that we really wanted to be able to rule out was whether these uh, strands could be tunneling nanotubes, even though we had shown they could uh, be degraded by DNAs. Um, she set up a series of studies using uh, uh, phalodin in order to uh, inhibit the, in order to stain uh, the potential uh, nanotubes. So here you can see uh, the, the cells uh, with the strands after the anti-CD3, CD28 stimulation stained with DAPI and then using phalodin to try and stain uh, potential nanotubes, you can see there is no staining. And then when you merge the two, uh, again, you see that you only have the staining with uh, DAPI, indicating that these strands indeed are uh, DNA uh, in terms of their composition. The next um, uh, set of studies was to use purified sorted CD4 and CD8 positive T cells. Now we're uh, getting down to more details about the uh, structure and the, uh, the types of strands that are produced by the different cell populations. And these really showed that CD4 cells uh, can produce, uh, can release extracellular DNA as can CD8. However, the morphology is completely different of this release. So CD8 cells produce like this burst, this halo of DNA around activated CD4 positive cells using anti-CD3 and anti-CD28, while the CD8 positive T cells produce these strands and often connecting 
uh, uh, two cells. So you can see here again, the strand from a CD8 cell and where we have one disintegrated and the other uh, cell is more intact. When you look at these um, uh, with, my, with my laser on, that's not gonna work. Sorry, let me go back to the arrow. So here you can see um, the the CDA derived uh, uh, lets in a in a more three D culture uh, in a three D image where you can see the cells and these lets uh, connecting between the different cell populations. So next, the question was really to see if these co-localize with CD one hundred seven positive vesicles. As as you saw in that earlier slide. Very often when Kara was able to identify uh, a CD8 cell connected to a target cell, the target cell uh, was in a uh, degradative state looking at characteristics of uh, dying or apoptotic cells with membrane blebbing. And you can see the difference between the, uh, these two cells. And when she stained with CD8 together with CD107, you could really see here clearly that there was often delivery of CD107 positive vesicles to a target cell. So this really started closing in on this uh, circle where we don't only have release of extracellular DNA from uh, CD8 positive T cells, but that these uh, extracellular DNA, it can deliver uh, CD107 positive vesicles to target cells. And we then went on to perform some, some movies. Uh, Carl set this up uh, again at OFMJ. And you can see here where this arrow is, we have a, uh, a CD8 positive cell that is beginning to produce a LET, uh, a, a lymphocyte extracellular. There we go. And then you can see uh, it, it leaving from the lymphocyte. So here's a cell that's previously uh, not uh, visible because it's excluding the dye. And then once you have the DNA uh, let come out, the cell then becomes uh, visible. Uh, and then here are just some uh, indications that we see staining in the appropriate cell populations uh, for the appropriate molecules, either identifying DNA or a live cell. So um, these really bring to light some other potential cytotoxic toxic mechanisms that could serve as new targets for helping prevent pathology and cutaneous disease. Um, in this particular model, we'll have many different cell populations being recruited to the lesion site, and in particular, uh, CD8 positive cells producing these LETs, and whether these could be uh, targets for uh, helping inhibit some of the cytotoxic uh, uh, pathology in these lesions and in others, uh, opens up a new uh, uh, potential area of investigation. So um, to, to, to finish up my talk today, um, I'm bringing to you some data from uh, a large study that we've had underway for the last four years uh, in collaboration with Jennifer Blackwell. There was a uh, uh, calling available several years ago from the Medical Research Council Newton Fund and CONFAPI. And Jennifer and I uh, entered into this uh, particular uh, 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 grant calling with Jennifer as the PI from the UK and myself from Brazil. And the goals of these studies were uh, twofold, uh, generally speaking. One was to look for um, uh, genes associated with cutaneous leishmaniasis for looking for susceptibility genes in a large GWAS study. And the other was to look at immunoregulation aspects of refractory versus responder patients and also lesion severity. So um, this was just a spectacular opportunity for us to have a, a, a study together where we would have GWAS data from uh, groups of patients, uh, cellular immune response data using the high dimensional flow cytometry, soluble factors using the Luminex panel, and also we perform transcriptome on a, a subgroup of patients. I will already tell you, I don't have uh, this data to show you today. I'm gonna to show you part of the data. Um, we are in the process of analyzing the, this whole uh, collection of data, um, which is, is taking a little bit longer, especially with the pandemic created some uh, uh, major delays in the progression of this part of the study. So um, luckily before the pandemic started, uh, uh, Leah uh, in, in uh, Bahia, she was the, the investigator responsible for uh, gathering all these different uh, uh, 
uh, samples, in particular the stage two, which was part of this study. So stage one had already been done in earlier studies by uh, Jennifer in collaboration with uh, 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 Leah and Edgar and others. And stage two was what was being performed uh, under this new grant, which was another thousand cases and another thousand controls. So we have a total then of 2000 cases and 2000 controls for full GWAS analysis. And again, this was the focus of uh, Jennifer Blackwell and Leah, uh, Leah's work, which was recently published in uh, uh, clinical infectious diseases. And using again samples from the same patients, we went on to look at some uh, of the immune uh, aspects of re uh, patients that were refractory to uh, antimony treatment and those that responded to antimony treatment. So first, looking at some of the GWAS analysis, um, we combined, we did a, a, a combination of some of our immune response data with the GWAS data in this study. And I'm just going to focus in on that aspect of the paper. I'm not going to go into any of the details about the genome-wide association study uh, and the complexities behind this sort of study. Again, this is Jennifer Blackwell's area and uh, Leah's area of expertise. Um, what I wanted to bring to you was that the GWAS analysis identified uh, a novel lead with some potential immune regulatory capacity uh, involving, involving interferon gamma production. So one of the hits that came up was this novel interferon gamma antisense RNA1 uh, gene. And this gene was associated uh, with a, uh, 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 a, higher, a higher chance of developing cutaneous disease. So this interferon gamma antisense RNA1 gene is really interesting in that it fine tunes interferon gamma production. Um, and it can affect interferon gamma, interferon gamma production in two different ways, depending on what cell population you're looking at. So um, in general, when you're looking at the antisense RNA1, uh, we think, oh, that's going to inhibit uh, interferon gamma. But it actually affects uh, topography and DNA structure. So it can both uh, inhibit interferon gamma production or can induce interferon gamma production depending on the cell population and the system that's being studied. So Jennifer uh, and Leah identified that this uh, GG, um, the, the, the G allele and the GG uh, genotype, the homozygous G allele, um, was associated with a greater risk of, uh, of disease development. So associated with cutaneous disease. And when we went on to take those same patients um, for which we had interferon gamma production data, we found that the percentage of cells producing interferon gamma and the percentage of cells producing TNF-alpha were lower in those individuals with the G homozygous um, genotype. So this was either for interferon gamma or TNF-alpha. And when we performed a correlation plot between the percentage of cells producing TNF and gamma, we saw a really strong uh, positive correlation. When we looked at the soluble levels of these cytokines, uh, both interferon gamma and TNF, which I didn't show here, um, we saw that the genotype um, was not associated with an increase or decrease in soluble uh, cytokine in the plasma. But the cell populations, uh, uh, T cell populations, again, stimulated with SLA, showed a dramatic decrease in the frequency of cells producing gamma based only uh, in this analysis on the uh, on the genotype. So this suggests that the homozygous disease associated allele, uh, uh, the G allele, that leads to this lower frequency of interferon gamma and TNF alpha um, could lead to a uh, higher chance of disease development. So this brings us back to something I mentioned at the beginning of our talk. Uh, depending on the disease phase, uh, we have different roles, different, different potential roles for interferon gamma and TNF alpha. So it's possible that upon first contact with leishmania, a, a, an individual that's able to produce higher levels of gamma and TNF alpha may have a beneficial effect for getting uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. So of course, upon that initial infection, if we can stop that infection in its tracks and not allow it to become a patent established infection, then um, that could be a beneficial role for high levels of gamma and TNF alpha. And that would fit with the model that these individuals that have lower levels are more susceptible to disease development. And then we have the disease established situation. So once the disease has been established and somebody already has a patent infection and you start developing uh, lesion pathology and activated uh, 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 TH1 type response and an exacerbated TH1 response, then high levels of gamma and TNF alpha 
may actually be pathology promoting and not as beneficial. So it's always important for us to remember uh, the progression of the disease and the different states in which we're talking about. And these studies really allowed us um, uh, to, to associate both uh, genomics and gene susceptibility uh, uh, aspects of leishmaniasis with some of the functional aspects uh, of the disease. And as I mentioned, the immune studies are uh, under analysis. We've performed all the studies. We're now currently uh, in the uh, analysis phase. And I'm bringing to you here just some of the data from the soluble uh, immune response data. This again is using 100 and, um, uh, 139 uh, patients that are uh, responders and 135 non uh, 135 refractory patients. And what we saw across a range of cytokines um, was that the refractory patients had a more exacerbated uh, 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 soluble cytokines uh, across several inflammatory cytokines and cytokines involved uh, with recruitment of cells to lesions, in particular PDGF. Uh, PDGF. So this was really striking, um, again, across um, this group of patients looking at both refractory and responder patients. Again, responder patients are those that respond to one round of antimony, and refractory patients are those that require more than one round of antimony. And um, when we performed some uh, modeling using uh, uh, modeling that takes into consideration many different factors, not only the cytokines, but also the clinical factors like the DTH response intensity, um, the best model that led to an area under the curve of 0 0.87 took into account DTH, IL-2, IP-10, MIP-1-beta, and the PDGF-beta. And so this was really uh, uh, a really strong power in terms of its predictive ability to, to indicate which patients will be refractory to uh, therapy and which will respond to therapy. And again, it's important to remember that all these plasma and blood and lesions were all taken before the patient uh, started their uh, therapeutic round. TNF-alpha alone uh, led to an area under the curve of uh, 0 0.63 which isn't spectacular, um, but it's, uh, it was a, a, um, uh, an interesting association for just uh, one cytokine. So these studies uh, as, a, as a whole um, really remind us, I think, that, that human continuous uh, disease is a complex continuum of disease development and pathology. Um, there are many different factors that are involved and many different time points that we have to remember to consider uh, when, when thinking about the dynamics of the disease. And of course, there's still lots to learn uh, uh, in the context of, of what will lead to protective responses, what will lead to pathology, and what leads to uh, persistence of an immune response. So we had several different cell populations that were associated with pathology. I didn't show you the data on V-beta-5 positive CD4 cells. Uh, this subpopulation was highly associated with pathology and disease um, uh, uh, disease severity, both in the tissue and in the blood. Uh, this work was done by uh, uh, Kiesen, who was a post, who was a, a PhD student in my lab several years ago. And uh, CD8 positive T cells, uh, again producing interferon gamma, cytolytic granules associated with uh, pathology. Th1 positive, CD4 positive T cells also. And we have this population of double negative in NKT cells that produce inflammatory cytokines, but we've never seen any correlation between uh, lesion severity and lesion size. So this opens up a window that these could be potential targets uh, for vaccines and for other uh, immunomodulatory aspects that could lead to an anti-leishmania response, but without so much pathogenic uh, potential. Um, and then lastly, the effects of a biased or stronger inflammatory Th1 type response early on disease, right upon infection, we may have a beneficial uh, uh, role for, for individuals that produce higher levels of interferon gamma TNF alpha early upon immediate, immediately after infection, while later after infection, those same characteristics could become detrimental to the patient. So these are some of the questions that we're addressing now with this uh, combined GWAS uh, immune studies looking at many different cell populations, the lesion transcriptome and the soluble immune response. And as you can imagine with these four different uh, um, high dimensional data sets, 
uh, it's a lot of uh, analysis to do, but it's uh, it's it's uh, starting to show some very interesting uh, results that we happen to we we hope to compile on a nice manuscript uh, in the in the coming month or so. So I'd like to uh, uh, call attention to the collaborators uh, and acknowledgments for the Leishmania studies. Uh, of course, we have the group in Salvador uh, Bahia, uh, headed by Edgar Carvalho uh, over the years. Uh, Leia, I want to call special attention for the MRC project, who was the lead and Lucas uh, postdoc fellow uh, uh, funded by the project during the collection of all those patient samples and also the implementation of the GWAS studies. Uh, Jennifer and her collaborators from the UK, uh, who performed the GWAS analysis, of course, in that uh, manuscript that I mentioned. Uh, Val Dutra, Daniela, and Carolina for all the studies I showed you. Uh, Liz, Antonelli, and, and Soraya. And my group uh, at uh, uh, Einstein and the second Mark are working on data analysis uh, for the immune response uh, studies, both the soluble uh, factors and the uh, transcriptome and the high dimensional flow cytometry studies. The bioinformatics group uh, headed by Israel Toja Silva and Jacqueline, our, our co-advised PhD student, has been working on a lot of aspects of the transcriptome analysis um, specifically. Our funding agencies, which were key for all this work, and uh, VOL studies uh, on the uh, CDA positive T cell LETS um, conducted uh, by Carolina Cole and collaborators in Val's lab at UFMJ. Um, Rodolfo also uh, was, a, was a key collaborator in those studies and the Department of Morphology for performing those beautiful uh, films and the, uh, uh, the, the electron microscopy uh, analysis. Uh, Liz Antonelli as well involved, now she's at Fio Cruz and the group at uh, uh, UFPA and Fio Cruz in, in Bahia. So thank you very much uh, uh, for the time and look forward to discussing any aspects uh, of this stuff. And I would like to say, I'm uh, obviously Val is here. Uh, so any questions related to the LETS and the CD8 positive T cell uh, studies, um, certainly those can be directed to her and uh, we can share other, other aspects. Okay, Ken, thank you very much for a fabulous talk as always. Um, although we are very close to the time of the next talk by Herbert, I think we do have time for one question now, and then we can save the following questions for uh, the round table later on. So if anyone has a question now or can, please feel free to, uh, to ask. I'm trying to find the, where I can see the little hands here. I think I have a question. Hi, Please, Ken. Claudia. No, hi, I, Claudia. Hi, hi, Ken. How are you doing? Uh, mm, good, good. I was curious about that uh, the result of this global wide uh, uh, analysis. Yeah. So, because when you have this GG that you have a lower production. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, lower uh, uh, production of interferon gamma. It's it's in the more severe uh, patients. Don't you think that is a this is a kind of contradictory uh, finding? Because no. So yeah, yeah. That's where we get into the timing issue. I think so. Um, the GWAS, the role of the GWAS study is is looking at disease susceptibility. So the only criteria there is whether uh, you have control individuals, uh, 2,000 control individuals, and 2,000 leishmania patients, cutaneous disease patients. And so that allele was identified uh, as, a tar as a hit in the sense that the GG allele, the G allele, either heterozygous or homozygous, is associated with uh, human cutaneous leishmaniasis disease, but nothing mm -hmm. to do with pathology or, or lesion yeah. size or disease development, just the presence, let's say the presence of disease. Oh, and that's okay. where I was mentioning this timing issue. So I think what that could be showing us, since we know that the then when we when we crossed Jenny and Leia's GWAS uh, genetic data with our immune data, 
that's when we saw that the GG allele is actually lower production. We, I agree with you. We were thinking it was going to be higher <laughs> um, yeah. when we we said, okay, let's look and see. You know, we already we had, we already done the staining, and we said, okay, Jenny, which she had to tell us which patients were GG and which were GC and which were uh, GC, uh, CC. We had so we have CC, GC, and GG. And so we went back uh, and and uh, did the analysis. And the nice thing, it was blinded, right? Because we had already done all the analysis. So we just pulled out those patients and saw that the GG was actually lower production. production. Yeah. And those are the ones that were more susceptible to getting the disease. Yeah. So then we thought, okay, that actually could make sense if we go back to this concept that we've discussed around vaccines, yeah. um, where if you have a, a stronger gamma tnf alpha production an activated inflammatory response at the moment you're infected with leishmania mm -hmm. you may just nuke it right there and you don't even go forward with a patent disease yeah but now we'll compare those genotypes with the pathology so we have that's what we're going to be doing with jenny now yeah. um is we have a larger number of patients uh um, where we have 20 um refractory and 20 responders with lesion sizes and we'll look at their genotype uh, uh, based on Jenny's and Leia's work. Mm. It's interesting because even based on the findings of subclinical patients that Edgar found that you have less interferon gamma, less the TNF alpha. So we can imagine that these patients at some time at the beginning of the beginning of the infection, they yeah. could reduce a lot of interferon gamma and TNF alpha also to control and they are immunoregulated. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I didn't think about that, but it could be. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it makes sense, yeah. And in the subclinicals, of course, we never know when they were, well, how long ago they were exposed. We know from the point Edgar yeah, exactly. looks at them first and then starts following, then yeah. they definitely awesome. follow over time. You, yeah. You are, you are investigating the patients in the, in the uh, another phase, not in the beginning, no? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's very exciting. Yeah. Okay. This data will be uh, fantastic, right? So a lot of patients, that's good luck you can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know these these are studies that really um, uh, multidisciplinary with uh, Jennifer Blackwell, who's you know, uh, and and Leah, who are are just experts at genetics and uh, uh, teasing out all the aspects of um, of working with five hundred thousand markers <laughs> across the GWAS, and then we'll we're we're obviously not going to we'll be working with uh, six markers that were identified as risk factors. And we'll just put those six into our uh, immune data overlay uh, since they're the same patients. So I don't know of any other study that's been able to tie together from the same patients, the soluble immune response, the transcriptome and the cellular response with GWAS. Uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. It's taking and a little while. The, the, the future, the epigenetic you know, features also, you know? Because you have all this kind of regulation that you yeah. we can discuss on the also. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. It will be crazy. Yeah. And, uh, and usually we're looking for one question, one molecule, it's impacting the others. But with it, this type of the studio, you can say if you have this up, up, up regulation, this situation has down, down regulation of the other molecules and try yeah. to talk of this data. So yes. the circulating, the lesion. So it'd be fantastic. Yeah. Yes. Okay, guys, this is this is very exciting. Ken, excellent talk, excellent participation, of course, as always from Claudia, who is always with us and giving great ideas, and also Herbert. But it's time for us to move to the next presentation, and then we can come back to the discussion later on. Um, so I'd like to introduce one of the organizers. It's a pleasure to introduce Herbert Gadges to give a talk today. Herbert uh, did his PhD uh, with Bachira Bergman, and he was already working on Leishmania during his, actually his master's and his PhD. They uh, studied, gave many contributions looking for um, targets and vaccine candidates at the time. And, and then Herbert had many uh, different experiences going to uh, uh, Albert Einstein School of Medicine, uh, UTMB in Texas for a while as well. And uh, he's been since then very interested in, in, in performing studies in leishmaniasis. Herbert is currently an associate professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. 
and a researcher at Instituto Osvaldo Cruz, the Phil Cruz in Rio as well. He is a CNPq uh, fellow uh, for a few years now, and he has been working in vaccine development for many, many years, as I mentioned, and now in his lab, and more recently in the aspects of immunobiology and looking for new therapeutic tools such as immunotherapy and treatment with stem cells. And what Herbert is going to do today is very interesting. It was a perfect choice for, the, for finishing this up because he's actually going to tie some of the aspects of the B cell response, which was addressed by Ramona, with T cell response, which was touched by Ken. So he will bridge together these two aspects of the immune response and immunoregulation. So Herbert, thank you so much, not only for organizing the meeting together with Danielle, but also for your presentation today. So you can take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Val, for your kind introductions. I cannot think of myself for inviting me, right? So, but I think that to be the idea was this talk with Ramona and came because of that, you now we'll be in the middle of the both. Thanks so much. Let me share the screen. Can you see this, this light? Perfect, you're good, yes. So good afternoon in Brazilian time. So we are talking today about the, it's a question more than an affirmation, tabulador B cells and T cell exhaustion in marine cutaneous leishmaniasis. So very brief, we know that leishmania amazonis can cause localizing and diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis. We know the difference, there are a lot of parasites here spreading, different from cutaneous localized. So one point that's very interesting and I was fascinated me, it's a work from Dr. Sung. So she showed when we infect the white type mice, so we have the lesion progressing here. Now, can you see my point here? No, I just, yeah, we can see a little arrow. That's fine. You can use the arrow. That's, we can see that. Okay, thank you. And when we infected, when she infected high knockout mice, we didn't see lesion. And the same for MHC2 knockout. So that means that T cells are involved in monopathology. And we compare with Leishmania major infection. So we can see here in the white type mice, we have the control of the lesions. But when you look at the high knockout mice, we have a progression lesion here, demonstrating that's totally different. And when it was transferred at uh, T cells, but knockout for T beds for high knockout mice, we have the same profile. It's important to note that there isn't a difference in the beginning of the infection, right? But so you have this, in this moment, we stop to control the lesion if there is progressions. Different from the different from the white type. So when we compare this type of study with Leishmania amazonensis that was showed for Nathan Peters in the first day, so you can feel the same. So we don't have a difference in the beginning of infection. This is from Bacteria's group. So, but in the chronic phase, there is a more controlled lesion progression with increase of parasite load. In the same way as observed by the uh, leaders group. So you can see here, uncontrolled lesion progression, you know, in the from gamma knockout mice, with control in the white type, but the difference in the parasite load only in the chronic phase. So the from gamma has a role, that's for sure. And uh, this role could be associated to, we don't know yet specifically, but helping the control lesion and parasite load for sure in the current phase. So my group have studied B6 mice for vaccines and for therapeutic tools. Today I'm going to more show data from BALBC, but it's something that is very interesting to know if you use a foot pad, we have this profile that we have a progression of lesion and then we have controlling that's becoming a chronic phase. So in this work, we show different mice from different facilities, different Leishmania amazonensis species. If you use foot pad, you have this profile. That's quite similar from El major, but in El major we have more control of the lesion that cannot see here for B6. So 
In B6, white type using footpad, and we have these profiles. And so for me, BALBC, it's a progressive, it's susceptible to Leishmania amazonensis infection, and B6 mice, which we call a partially resistant mice. So we know if you look at diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis, we, we have no DTA response, low IO2 production, no specific antigen proliferation, a high number of parasites. And if you look here, we have antibody and the IO10. So for many, many years, and I was excited about the fact that Leishmania amazonensis, a lot of manuscripts, papers, results, it's went down the immune response. This data is from Claudia, and uh, we can see that the infected, the dendritic cells by Leishmania amazonensis did not activate the dendritic cells. This is his home on the dendritic cells. That's just a fantastic. And uh, recently we show, Professor Sung shows before, and we recently show that we cannot see this in the dendritic cells, Morini dendritic cells. So it's something, very excited how Leishmania amazonensis can drop the immune response. That's fantastic. So Leishmania amazonensis reduce and suppress effect response. So one of my questions now is what are the molecules associated to suppression and immunopathology? Because I believe it to immune responses went down, we need something up to suppress. Of course, we, we know about TGF beta, IO10, but to now try to understand it deeper in some cells and some response. I don't want to surprise you during the meeting, so I'm going to show our ideas. We are looking for IO10 producing B cells to try to understand the role of these cells. And you're looking for T cells expressing PD1 and which cells are expressing PD1. So I'm trying to understand how those molecules can help the immune response. So B cells and the regulatory B cells, there is a participation for producing cytokines as IO-10, IO-35, TGF-beta. So you can see here in this cartoon, block it, affect or T cells response, promote regulatory T cells responses, block APCs, as well block cytotoxic T cells. So the role of B cells, it's uh, very regulatory. And one aspect that's important, we don't have a specific marker for regulatory B cells, still we don't have. So usually we look for production of IO-10. So we call IO-10 positive B cells or producing B cells. But you can see here that different populations of B cells as B1, MZB, follicular B cells, that both are here, B2 cells can become iotin produces cells. So because that's the, the main iotin productions is the, the main target that we need to look to see these cells. So Professor Sanders group demonstrated before that when you use GHG knockout mice, so you have a decrease of the lesion progression without affect parasite load. So this is something that our show for us it's quite surprising. And, and recently it was demonstrated in um, Leishmania Donovan's infections in dogs, there is an increase of iotin on B cells. So we did this question, is there induction of iotin producing B cells in Leishmania Amazonian infection? So first we can see here there is an increase the frequencies of B2 cells, sorry for my dog, Lilita, an increase of B2 cells in the frequency and decrease of friction of TCD4, the 40 cells. And here, when you look for numbers, you can see a high increase of the number of B2 cells. It's a huge expansion of B cells on draining lymph nodes. So, and we look at the iotin productions, we can see here in the frequency, the major source on lymphocytes, at least that we studied, B2 cells are the major source of iotin. You can see here in the frequency and the number, look here the dot plot. So B cells are producing iotin in the brain lymph nodes. 
So based on that, we decided to store the biopsy XID mines. So it's a mutation in BTK. So you have low B1 cells, problems in maturation and activation of B2 cells, but still we have B2 cells interactions. So when you look at in the in vivo infections, we can see we have shower lesions, show lower lesions on XID mice without affected parasite load. So that's very similar to Professor Sung's data. And of course, when I look at the frequency of B cells, we can see here in the lymph nodes a decrease in the XID. Of course, we have some expansion. If you look at XID, but we have a decrease of B cells in comparison to white type in frequency and the numbers. So when you look at antibody production, for sure we can see XID mice has lower titles of uh, IgG, IgG1. I think this is the most difference. We can see comparing white type and XID, AgG. 2A, the same, AGG2B, and you don't have difference in IDG2, AGG3, sorry. And when you look for iotain production, you can see here we have a decrease of iotain and footpad spleen in the draining lymph nodes. So while some tissues that we look, you saw a decrease of iotain. So it's something that shows for us that maybe B cells could be one of the source in these different tissues. So, and using the XID mice, looking at the draining lymph nodes, we look at what impacted the iotin production, the use of XID mice in the infection. We can see here, there is a decrease in no production of iotin XID mice in frequency, and in number, this data is very big. So when you use exogenomycin or infected exogenomycin, you don't have this iotin production by B cells. So, and then moving for the next question, how about B1 cells that we know that can produce iotin? So we try to do some in vitro experiments and ex vivo experiments as well. So we, we culture B1 cells and we simulate with uh, from my goats from Leishmania Amazonensis, we can see uh, iotain productions. But if we did the primer together with LPS, we have an increase in, in comparison of I LPS. So we can have more iotain production. And so we decided to compare B1 cells from infected mice, from naive mice in culture. We can see here when you use B1 cells from infected compared to naive and culture with a goat, we did not see difference. But when you use a massive goat, you can see axenic massive goat, you can see an increase of iotain that's coming from infected mice. So this surprised us, and we decided to look and we saw a difference. So if you compare naive with infected mice, we can see a decrease of B1A cells and the, the increase of the frequency of B1B that we can see here, a decrease of B1A and increase of B1B. So we decided to do the add back transfer B1 cells for exogenized and then infected the animals. And we didn't see any difference in the lesion profile in the parasite load, we don't have a difference between white type and XID in the same when you use the add back. And you can see here, when we transfer this B1 cells for XID mice, we have an increase of this population. They have more B1 cells when we did the add back and it starts to work similar than white type. So with the decrease of B1A, and increase of B1, B, but this not affect the progression of the disease in the XID. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, we can see this work has been done for Luan Firmino Cruz, is a PhD student in my lab. So he did this work during his master, and now he's seen looking for how iotain producing B cells can regulate immune response. This is the topic of his PhD. 
Now I'm going to move for the for the second part that to look the PD1 and PD1 expression in the impact of this in the immune response. So you know that PD1 and PD2 are ligand for PD1 cells and have some aspects and immune aspects that can suppress immune response during that, that we can call exhaustion. Of course, exhaustion, it's a complex process. There are a lot of ligands as PD1, TIN3, LAG3, IO10 production, TGF beta production, and decrease of IO2, TNF alpha, and interferon gamma, and decrease of proliferation of CD8 and CD40 cells. So we know this data from a lunch, Professor Alan Sharp group. So we can see here, she infected the PD1, knockout mice, and PD2, knockout mice with Leishmania mexicana. And she could see that uh, there is a decrease in the lesion in PD1 knockout mice in comparison to white type. In the PDL2, there is an increase of the lesion. When you look here, there is a decrease of a, a parasite load in PD1 knockout mice and increase of parasite load in PDL2. So, and recently was published a data that uh, PD1 may mediate the T cell exhaustion. It's a data from one patient with diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis that she show that during simulation with antigen, we have the increase of a PD1 expression from patients. So that data is very interesting and can help us to try to understand how this disease is so supersive. So we know that about the treatment of leishmaniasis, there is toxicity, failure, resistance. So we need new targets. We discussed uh, yesterday about the price and, and I think the first day with Paul as well. So the price is a problem, but we need to find targets that we can modulate because maybe it's not for several patients, but you can try to help some individuals that has more CFE disease. So the use of a monoclonal antibodies could be one of these tools. It's something that is very interesting. So we have the T cell activation, so we have a proliferation, cytokines, and cytotoxicity. But you can, this cell can become exhausted. So if you have the expression of PD1, become this T cell exhaustion, decrease in proliferation, cytokines, and cytotoxicity. But you can revigorate this response if you block using monoclonal antibodies. So this study has been shown for cancer and for different diseases. So we can revigorate these T cells. So it's something that we're looking here for leishmaniasis. So we started to, to see the expression of the PD-1 on T cells and PD-1 on the enriched cells. So after infection, we look at the, on the drainage lymph node cells. And what saw, we see an increase of frequency of uh, PD-1 in CD11C, the enriched cells, and the numbers as well. And you also could see an increase of uh, PD-1 expression on CD4 T cells as the same in CD8 T cells. We can see here decreasing the frequency and the numbers of PD1 on CD4 and CD8 T cells. And so we decided to start the treatment. So we started treating once a week with 100 microgram per doses and you use anti-PD1, anti-PD1 and anti-PD2. So we infected and seven days later, we start the treatment and then we perform the parasite load. So when you use just treatment once a week, we cannot see any difference, but when you decided to treat twice a week with the same molecules and, and we perform the treatment and look at the phenotypes, we could see an increase of the lesion when you use anti PD1 and anti PD1. Sorry for a moment. Sorry, guys. And we could see a decrease of parasite load. So, in the treatment with anti PD1 and anti PD1. So, for sure, we have an increase of inflammatory response here that culminates in more lesions, but that we have the beneficials that we can control parasite load. So we decided to look in interferon gamma response. 
So we repeat the experiment, so two times, and we see the same phenotype. So increasing the lesion and decreasing the parasite low in the both treatment. So when, you, when we look in, in the drain lymph nodes, we also see decrease of a parasite load in the same in the spleen. When you look about the frequency of CD8 T cells in the number after treatment, we didn't see difference in the drain lymph nodes. But when you look at the interferon gram productions in all CD8 T cells, we could see an increase of frequency in the anti PD1 treatment and also in anti PD1 treatment. In the same was observing the numbers of the producing interferon gamma cells. And what we can see here, the difference, it's important to see this data because we don't have a difference in naive and infected. We don't have in the infection on bulbicin mice, the induction of interferon gamma. But when it did the treatment, so this interferon gamma pop up, we can see this production with a difference in the frequency in the numbers. So we start to look in different populations that are PD-1 and interferon gamma positive or negative. So in the treatment using anti-PD-1, we can see here an, uh, an increase in the anti-PD-1 treatment, an increase of interferon gamma on PD-1 negative cells. So that we can see here this huge increase, but we don't have a difference in the numbers of these cells. When I look at uh, interferon gamma negative and the PD-1 positive, we can also see a decrease in the anti-PD-1 treatment, but without affecting the numbers. And when I look at the frequency of double positives, interferon gamma and PD-1, we could see an increase in the anti-PD-1 treatment in the frequency in the numbers. So we can see, we saw here that it, we have the revigoration of a CD8 T cell. So these cells become to produce interferon gamma again. So when I look at these CD4 T cells, we cannot see difference in the frequency and the numbers. And when we look at the four on, on, on CD4 T cells, in total CD4 T cells, we could see an increase of a frequency in the anti PD1 and the anti PD L1 treatments. But to, we just could see an increase of numbers of cells in the anti-PD-1 treatment. So we have this increase here in the frequency in comparison to the naive and the infected. When I start to look at the, this population that we look at for CD8 T cells, so in the interferon gamma positives and PD-1 negatives, we didn't see modulations. When we look for PD-1 negative and PD-1 positive cells, we just see frequency and an increase of the frequency in anti-PD-1 treatment. But when you look in the double, in from gamma and PD-1 double positive cells, we could see the increase in the frequency in the anti-PD-1 and the anti-PD-1. So we cannot see difference in the number, but we also we can see here the revigoration of T cells to produce interferon gamma. When I look at the cytokines in the C2, we can see a decrease of IL-4 and TGF beta in the treatment with anti-PD-1, but without effect IL-10. But when we look for anti-PD-1 treatment, we cannot see it for IL-4. We don't have a statistical difference for TGF beta. Of course, we have the reduction, but it's not statistic. So we show that we modulate at least with using anti-PD-1, some cytokines in, in situ. But to move for the questions, we'd like to see more in the change to what's going on. We know that the numbers and the frequency of the neutral cells on lesions, it's um, a few numbers. So of course, we thought about microphase and monocyte, but we think also about neutrophils. And so we, we start to study with neutrophils and we start using recruited neutrophils in, in peritoneal cavity and you use it, stain it, with CFC 
And after four hours of interactions, we're looking for a PD1 expression. So here, we, we use a promassive gold and a massive gold, axenic massive gold. So we saw these interactions happen for both a promassive gold and a massive gold. And for both a promassive gold and a massive gold, an increase of an neutrophils expressing pd one And we look for CFSC positive cells and negative, we could see an increase of CFSC positive cells that show for us that interactions are modulating this pd one expression. So after, because we recruited it, it's more activated in neutrophils. So we decided to use bonomary deriving neutrophils so we purify using percol neutrophils, and we use the same Lichtmannian amazonase staining with say FSE, and after we look at the PD1 expression. So we could see here the amas go to become more neutrophils become more infected or more interacting with the mice goats when you use these neutrophils. When we look at the expression of a PD1, we could see an increase of a mice goat in comparison to promise goats here, but also both the promise goats and a mice goats can do, can drive PD1 expression on neutrophils and the dispopulation more in CFSE positive cells. So after we look at for humans, so we did the debrification using FICOL and then we did the interactions. So it's something that's surprising us Axenic massive goats try to escape from neutrophils. So you can see here, it's a small amount of neutrophils became CFSE positive in comparison to promassive goats. But there is a, a shift here that uh, directed or infected neutrophils with a massive goats increase PD1 expression in comparison to promassive goats. And this population is more in CFC positives that show for us that neutrophils that are interacting with Leishmania are expressing PD1. So we decided to move back to mice and to see in the skin's lesions what's going on. So we did the infection. In 15 and 60 days, we start to look and to analyze this expression in vivo. So we could see here an increase of neutrophils 15 days post infections. And we saw an increased expression of PD1 on those neutrophils in frequency and number and MFI. That demonstrated that 15 days after infection, we already have neutrophils expressing PD1. And then we did in the chronic phase, the 60 day post infections. So we could see here. An increase, it's a huge increase of neutrophils in the in the lesion. And we saw here in the frequency in the numbers of these neutrophils. And when you look at the for the PD1 expression, we can see here an increase in the frequency in the PD1 neutrophils and the numbers of the PD1 neutrophils in the alpha and the five. So we try to see in vivo using cofocal intravital cofocal microscopy. So he used the treatment with antivirus using LY6E and pd one with fluorochromes to see in vivo it to try to look at neutrophils expressing pd one in vivo. So unfortunately, we did not see the expression of pd one in circulating neutrophils. So you can see neutrophils here is in green and not red. So green is neutrophils and red is pd one But when we look here in the chronic lesions, of course the lesion is a mess, but if you look in the neighborhoods, we can see cells that are neutrophils and the expression of pd one at the same time. Of course we have cells that are not neutrophils that are expressing pd one we can see here, there are different cells that are like here expressing pd one but they are not neutrophils, but see we have neutrophils uh, expressing pd one So after we saw these high numbers of neutrophils expressing pd one 
we think about the possibility of these neutrophils be drained for lymph nodes. So, and we look at, to see if we could see in the drained lymph nodes neutrophils expressing PD1. So, we saw an increase in infected mice, an increase of neutrophils in the drained lymph nodes. So, we could see here in the frequency and the numbers. And we also saw an increase of PD1 expression frequency and the number, but not no in the MFI. So, what's the impact of these in immune response in lymph nodes? We don't know. And also of these neutrophils and the lesions, and we don't know. But we try to see the interaction of T cells and neutrophils. So, we use CD8 C cells from B6 mice. So, because of that, we need to evaluate the expression of pd one from neutrophils from B6 mice. We could see uh, an increase. So, these neutrophils can be infected. This was in promastigotes and increase the frequency of pd one In this frequency, is higher on CFC positive cells. And then we perform the co-culture and use effect of T cells to mimic the lesion. So we could see here a co-culture of TCD8, TCD8 T cells with neutrophils. And here, when you compare with infected neutrophils, there is decrease of interferon gram production. When you use isotype control, we didn't not see difference. But when you use anti-PD1 or anti p PDL1, we can, we can restore interferon gamma production. So these neutrophils expressing PDL1 has suppressor capacity, at least in vitro. So, and how about L brasiliensis? So we try to see in human neutrophils if is there induction of PDL1, it's the same protocol. We saw something that's different. In, that in Leishmania amazonensis, also from mastigotes, and mastigotes can be very well infected or interacted with neutrophils. And when you look at expression of pd one we could see for both for mastigotes and promastigotes, and also similar, more pronouncing the only on CFC positive cells. So after we did in the skin tissues, um, this experiment to see if in human cutaneous leishmaniasis can have ex neutrophil expressing PD1. So we saw an increase of PD1 elastase double positive cells and a great increase in default chance compared with healthy donors. So we could see it. And here we can see the skins, this beautiful image coming from Daniel's lab. And we could see here elastase in green and pd one in red. We can see a lot of cells that are red that are not neutrophils, but we also could see here neutrophils expressing pd one So this work has been done for Dr. Alessandro Fonseca Martin during he, her PhD in my lab. And then we are going to show some data that I did when I did the visiting research, that one, we are working to finish the manuscript. So we are showing some data of this manuscript today, uh, visiting research that I did in Professor Zoom Lab, that I need to say thank you for the opportunity. So remember that B6 is different from Bob C. So we start to study B6, but this is in the chronic phase, not in the resolution phase, but it's in the peak of factions. So you can see a lot of parasites and decrease of the lymph nodes. And when you look by real-time PCR, some co molecules, we could see the increase of pd one and pd one in the infected tissues. And for the other molecules like guitar, icos, and oxy 40 there is not a, a good correlation, but here we have increase of pd one and pd one at the same time. So looking at the drain lymph nodes, we could see an increase of pd one in on CD11C and MHC class two high cells in the infected, 
in comparison to naive. And also we could see an increase of PD-1 on CD40 cells infected in frequency and the number we can see here on CD40 cells in comparison infected with naive. So based on that, we move for bone marrow derived dendritic cells and to see if the Leishmania mosaic can drive the PD-1 expression and to see the response of PD-2. Well and then we, we saw a beautiful phenotype. If you compare the enriched cells that are not infected with the enriched cells that are infected, or at least the FEC positive that interacted. But we also can compare here the enriched cells on the, <clears throat> that are in the same situation, but are not infected or not the FEC positive cells. But when you compare the, the CFSC positive with the CFSC negative, we can see an increase of PDL1, but a decrease of PDL2 on CFSC positive cells. So we did this for B6 and for BALBC mice. So we have a decrease, you can see here, of PDL1. An increase of PDL1 on the enriched cells for a mice goat and for pro mice goat, and the decrease for PDL2 in a mice goat and pro mice goat. In B6 mice, the same phenotype in BALBC mice. So we decided to do co culture to see the impact of this T interaction with the enriched cells. So we use the bone marrow derived enriched cells from white type and the PDL1 knockout mice. We use anti CD3 and the I. L2, and you use the, the enriched cells to give the secondary stimulus. And the, what we could see here, when we compare in, for regulatory T cells, because you use naive CD4 T cells, so CD4 positive and CD25 negative cells in this culture. And you could see here, there's an increase of regulatory T cells based on infection, but when you look for PD-1 knockout, you didn't see any difference, it's still high. High than the infected one, that's surprising us when this co-culture. But when we look at the for the effect on T-beta expression, T-beta expression on T cells, we could see that uh, in a mass goat, the, the enriched cells infected by a mass goat, decrease T helper one response, in vitro, but when you look for PD-1 knockout mice, you could not see this difference. So you asked about any in vivo. So what happened in T-HELP-1 in regulatory T cell response? So I can say that there is no difference in regulatory T cells when you look for PD-1 knockout mice, but when you look at T for t helper so first deletion. So we could see similar that Professor Lanshak saw so a decrease in the lesions in the PDN1 knockout mice and decrease of a parasite low. Of course, it's a small decrease, so there are other molecules involved for sure, but there is a small decrease in the parasite load. And we look for interferon gamma productions on CD4 T cells. We could see a huge increase here on double positive cells for interferon gamma and t bit cells that you can see in frequency. We also have the same increase in the numbers. And they look for in, in situ cytokine productions. We saw an increase of interferon gamma and a decrease of IL-4. There is a decrease of IL-17. So, but this increase of interferon gamma was as expected. So, we still have this question about Leishmania brasiliensis because if you recompare mucosa with diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis, so we have the extreme response, but we have here cutaneous leishmaniasis, which there is in the middle of this response. And we mean we have a lot of players that can do and modulate and regulate response. So yesterday we saw the presentation of several uh, speakers, now, Phil, Lucas, and Daniel talk about the immunopathogenesis associated to CD8 and NT T cells, and also the role of senescence in immunopathogenesis. 
but we still have a lot of here molecules in combinations when you look at cutaneous leishmanias, not the stream like mucosa and diffusers. So this work has been done for Daniel, <coughs> Daniel's group. That's a beautiful work that show show for us a PD1 expression in skins from infected piece and uh, tissues. In fact, the tension, sorry. So we could see the increase of PD-1 response here, and the also an increase of PD-1 on CD4 T cells, and the also PD-1 in CD8 T cells. And if you look for PD-1 and PD-2 expression, we saw an increase of a macrophage in the, in the lesions, but you saw an increase of PD-1 and the also increase of PD-2 on those macrophages. So PD-1. Macrophage expression PD1 and macrophage expression PD2. And when we did co culture using PBMC from healthy donors and, and for patients, he could see here, it's a beautiful data. When you look at that from gamma production, so for CD4 and CD8 T cells, we have a, when you put the antigens, so those cells has, have the capacity to produce interferon gamma. But when we put antibody to block PD1 and the PTL2, we have an increase of interferon gamma productions in both CD4 and CD8 cells. So we have those cells or exhausted cells in the part of this pool of cells, and then block these cells pop up and start to produce interferon gamma. So we have production of interferon gamma in the patient, but when you block, it will increase. So the same was saw for TNF alpha productions. When he looked at the cytokines, you could see the same for different gram productions, but he didn't see for TNF alpha productions. So I'm going to finish it because it's not only my time is finished, right? So sorry, we did three slides, sorry. And uh, so we're looking more CD4 cells, but we're also looking CD8 T cells. And when you look at a uh, receptor, toll like receptor 9 knockout mice and compare white type knockout, we saw a difference in the lesion progression is very small, but we have a great difference on parasite load. And when we did it in the peak of infections, we saw difference in lesion progressions. We saw the same, we have an increase in the parasite load. And we looked in situ cytokines, we saw in Decrease of interferon gamma receptor, tolic receptor 9 in knockouts. And uh, when you look at all CD8 T cells, TLR9 uh, uh, knockout mice impair interferon gamma production on CD8 T cells, but didn't have this impair on CD4 T cells, specifically CD8 T cells. So, we have a lot of first students. So this study was done for Juliana and for Alessandra. So our perspective, we have a lot of more questions. So we're still looking the fact that it involved the induction of those molecules and what's the fact that the presence of those molecules impacted in immune response. So I need to say thank you for all my collaborators. There are a lot, so I don't have time. I'm so sorry in my institutes. I, look, I would like to say, to say thank you for the groups that are working in the Federal University and the Svaldo Cruz Foundations, and for my students, and also for amazing times that we had before pandemic situation, but I hope that in the future we can start to be together again. Thanks so much for your attention. And Thank you so much, Herbert. It was excellent talk. Sorry, um, I didn't. I didn't get to start my my time. No, so you were I perfect. Was... You were, because we started five minutes late, so you were actually right on time. So oh, very, very you. good. I think perfect. You. Is yeah, because we took five minutes from your talk with Ken's questions. So you're good. Very good. Thank you. Um, so now uh, I I think. We can have the questions for Herbert, and if anyone wants to ask any other questions to the other people that presented today or make comments, 
please, uh, it's the time to do so. I see that Lucas has raised his hand. So Lucas, go ahead. Hello, Ebert. Hi, Eval. Hey, uh, nice talks, nice section. Thanks. Um, I just have a, a, a little comment about the, the B, uh, regulatory B cells, Ebert. I want to know, we see this uh, association of antibodies, IgG antibodies, with severity of disease in human cutaneous mucosa of disseminated leishmaniasis. And uh, actually, if we block the FC uh, gamma receptors, we decrease inflammatory response. So I'm wondering if there is any signal that you can just uh, uh, switch a cell that's coming in the, the lesion, turn it into a regulatory B cells, uh, if it's possible. I'm sure there, there's lots of plasma cells over there and uh, it's possible not to be too late, right? But uh, there are some immature B cells coming in as well. We are looking at this on mice now. It's the part of a Luan project to see the iotin production in situ by B cells you reach at this population, but it, we are not sure about the mechanism of induction of uh, iotin by B cells. We're still looking for some molecules to see if the interaction directly from the parasites in same moment or the antigens from some, some antigens from the parasites or about the cytokines in, in the environment. So because the increase of an inflammatory response, we need to to do a reduction of this inflammatory response, so perhaps the regulatory response. So maybe B1, B cells, and in this case, B2 cells, could be one of those cells that could do this regulation. So, but we need to be sure about how these cells work on the situ. So if it has this regulatory response. So now, of course, doing cultures with effector cells and B cells, iotin producing B cells, we saw the suppression of the, the inflammatory response. But it's a very interesting question, complex questions, at least when you're looking for human disease, that's, there are several components. But it's a very interesting to see, look at, we talked before in meetings before, we said that you are trying to see this response on B cells, that's fantastic. If you could go on this to see how patients in the IoT production for B cells will be very important for the future. Yeah, I think you're gonna do this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Claudia? Hi. Uh... Thank you. Very, very nice talk, uh, Ebert. Really, I am impressed with the amount of results that you presented today. It's About five minutes. Yeah. Sorry. But it's interesting because when you talk about Leishmania mesonensis in, in the mouse, uh, it's completely different from the Ebola mesonensis in humans. So this is my point, because in the lesions, for instance, in humans, if you think about diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis, you, uh, you, you don't have a T cell response or even B cell response. You have a, a few uh, amounts of interferon gamma and so on. So um, in, when we analyze it, for instance, in the in work, in a study that we uh, have done with Elvira, we uh, observed that, for instance, the, the infection of, of dendritic cells with Leishmania amazonensis or with neutrophils infected with Leishmania amazonensis is a kind of crosstalk about dendritic cells and neutrophils. So we have really a kind of suppressive response. Uh, we have a decrease in all the uh, accessory, the, the, the molecules on surface of the dendritic cells. So I don't know, it, it's hard just to, to concatenate the idea that you are doing about the interferon gamma and uh, leishmania mesonensis because it's not really what we can see in the patients, no? Even in the uh, localized cutaneous leishmaniasis, you can comment about that? For sure. I'd like to start to thank all collaborators. So for neutrophils, if Elvira as well. So thank you so much yeah. for all collaboration, Elvira. And um, it's a very good point, Claudia. So we usually talk in the lab that BBC is like diffuse cutaneous leishmanites. And the B6 is, is some, could be some patients that has some response. Because when we saw in B6 mice in footpath, 
that's different from years. So we saw a uh, lesion progression, then stopped like a peak. And then there is a partially resolution, it become chronic in state. So we cannot use Leishmann amazonensis antigens because it's a beautiful work, for, work from Bartira's group that show that uh, these antigens has capacity to induce apoptose on T cells. But uh, we have a secret, we can use Leishmania major antigens. So when you use that, we can start to see some re specific response. Now we are doing that to the more, try to see specific antigens or some cross specific antigens. So, but in B6, in B6 mice, we have sort of different gamma response. But if you ask me, it's a lot, it's not a lot. It's hard to see, it's very hard to see. Okay. And uh, when you look, now we try to look at uh, as, um, some other markers in memory T cells, effector T cells, memory effector T cells, and uh, it's very hard to see. And uh, you use non specific anti and stimulatory like PMA anomycin, it's very, very hard. Very, very hard. But uh, when you start to use these cross antigens using Leishmania major antigens, we start to see a little bit. So I hope to show for you guys in the future some of this because we are doing now, and, but it's very hard. So one thing that I can say for you that is a uh, very beautiful result that I hope to come soon. When we infected B6 mice with Leishmania amazonense and do a second infection, as was done for David Sachs and for Phil Scott to, uh, to see the importance of the uh, T cells and memory T cells, the skin memory T cells uh, for Leishmania amazonense. We could see a protection of the lesion, but we never saw protections in parasite load. Mm -hmm. So Leishmanization using Leishmania amazonense infections control the disease, but not parasite load. So this parasite has the ability to skip Mm -hmm. This control. So I, I think there is some fact that Leishmania amazonis induced in the microphage. So in the receptor of interferon gamma, it's something and it, several other molecules that is um, modulated and we cannot cure. So it's something that we need to look. And uh, using the other works from the group, so starting with Bartira, and uh, I'd like to thank Bartira for collaboration on vaccines. And uh, I was was, his student, I was his student for a long time. And uh, after I finished my PhD, we start to do uh, intranasal vaccines in my projects. So when you do the, this strategy to do tolerization, we have control of lesions and the parasite load. So when you have a, a only pro-inflammatory response, we can control lesions or parasite. But when you have tolerance response, we can control both. I think maybe this is the secret for Leishmania Amazonensis. Yeah, for Leishmania Brasiliensis also. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I have already shown to you the results. But anyway, uh, I think it's interesting. And even with Leishmania Brasiliensis that you can see PD-1 and pd one for me is intriguing too, because uh, I think that the behavior of Leishmania Brasiliensis in infected cells are completely different. So Yes. No, I, I totally agree. So our, uh, you, Daniel, Lucas, Phil, uh, Edgar, have to look, Val, have to look at that because I think there is something in the time point and there is specific mechanism. I think Ken told this very well because we don't have this falling in the lesions and it's very hard because I think there is modulations. Sorry. I think there is modulations in Sorry, I cannot. <laughs> I think I got no, and uh, I changed my device and so. And uh, so I think that's very in, in several moment, moments you can have specific questions and moments that's very hard. So, but I think we need you guys to try to understand better how senescence and exhaustion cells can work together in this environment. So I can have a question for all of you. We are in round table. Maybe exhausted T cells can help it, you know, to avoid excessive inflammatory response. Why not? Because uh, we know that PD-1, for example, in pregnancy, 
is very important yeah. to keep the prevalence. So maybe for lichen minor Brazilians, the exhaustion is not bad. Maybe exhaustion is a good process to avoid the excessive inflammatory response. So I think you, you guys should look at that because it'd be beautiful. Yeah, but after There's the, still the two doctor, questions here then... for you, Herbert. There's two, Elvira and Daniel, that want to ask questions, I believe, to you. So maybe Elvira and then Daniel. Actually, I, I was going to ask for you and Kim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because I, I, I work very close to Ebert, so I... You ask questions I, I ask to him? I ask questions straight for him, yes. So very nice talk, all of, all the ones that I, I listened this afternoon. Congratulations to everyone. Uh, what I would like to know probably is for you or for Ken is about the LEDs. So if you look that they are, uh, it, these LEDs are induced when the CD8 T cell uh, contact an infected macrophage, for instance, and if you saw some uh, cytotoxicity of just the, the LEDs for macrophages or oh. something like that. So, Elvira, no. We, so, the, the first question if we see uh, the release of LEDs by the contact with macrophages, we haven't done that yet because all the experiments that we did were with anti CD3, anti CD28. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so no, no direct interaction with macrophages. We haven't looked at it yet. but. This was actually one of the suggestions that we received upon the review of the paper. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting thing to see and a nice way also of showing antigen specific um, uh, killing. Yes, if I mean activation of the CD8 T cell. And the experiment of taking the, uh, the supernatant to see whether the actual uh, LEDs would lead to any killing or activation. We did one experiment with that, with Leishmania, and also with cells, and we didn't see we didn't see any increase in uh, expression of an exin five. But we do need to repeat that because uh, this was done like in a. We did actually because of you know Anderson's your your work in Anderson's paper showing that the actual supernatant itself was able to control the leishmania. We didn't see that with Brazilians, but we didn't have the right controls. We didn't have the Amazonensis that you guys showed it worked on. So we do have to repeat that to see. Even, even in the lesions, you, you couldn't find the this legs close to the infected cell. I see. Well, I see. I see what you're saying. Which cell? So yeah, so we do have that data. Carol is analyzing that data now of looking uh, where we do have that data, where the two ends of the LED are touching, yeah? Mm -hmm. The issue with that is uh, we were like kind of, that's a good, excellent question because you may help me with that. So the issue is when you look in the lesion, often you see the beginning and the end of the LED touching one cell and another, leaving from one cell and going to another, supposedly. But not always. So it's not uncommon that you see the cell that is releasing the lead without seeing the end of it. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of like wondering how we would quantify that because that would be sort of like a, a, an impartial, you know, quantification since we cannot see the beginning and the end of all of them. How could we do that? We could normalize if we compare, for example, early and late lesions we could normalize and just call 100% the ones that we see beginning and end and see which cell is in the end. Mm -hmm. but, it's the so only way, the I best... think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That would okay. be very interesting. Yeah. I think so the Carol name is doing be, that. The name I... could be, maybe the name could be fishing. Yeah. <laughs> it's my feeling, you know, the fishing cells. <laughs> Yeah. Let's think about the name. Okay, Ovida, thank you. Now, Dan? Uh, I have I have a couple of questions, some for, for Ken and you, and another one for, for Herbert. But I can start with Ken and you, once you, you, okay. you had the warm-up ready <laughs> in <the> answer, <laughs> answering the questions. So the uh, j just like a, a 
the question is a bit connected with, with the Elvira asked. Uh, when we see uh, your data from lesions, we can see that some CD8 uh, do the, the, the net and some not. So what do you think that is controlling this uh, uh, in, in the CD8s? This is a very, very interesting question, Dan. So we, we were also wondering about that. And not only in the lesions, but when you do the in vitro experiments with anti-CD3, anti-CD28 and purified CD8s, you see that not all of the CD8s release LEDs. So there is something going on with some CD8s that respond that way. So there's a couple of possibilities, either uh, and we are, we are trying to address that with the new experiments now. Either these CD8 cells are, um, for example, memory preactivated cells that upon that stimulation react that way, or they could be very activated almost at the end of their, uh, you know, of their functional activity because these cells will, will die as well. As soon as they release the, the DNA, they will die. I was actually looking at this uh, today with Ken, and you can clearly see, you know, Ken, that they, you see in the movie that they are already labeled as dead cells. So uh, one possibility would be that this would only catch or would be a mechanism of cells that are at the end of their activation state. So to use your, your uh, vocabulary, it could be, for example, the senescent cells, the cells that are at the end of their you know, so this is something that we are trying to address now with new experiments, co-staining with memory markers and with memory for late differentiation to see why is that that some release the LEDs but not all of them. And in fact, the, the if you look, the frequency is not, it, it's not like all of them or 50% of them. You see a good percentage, but it's still a low frequency. It's not like Elvira's data that when they, they induce the neutrophils to release the LEDs. They, you know, they do a much better job than the than the lymphocytes. That's for sure. May I ask? Yeah, uh, may I say something? There is an old paper uh, uh, correlating the expression of CD one hundred and seven with the cytotoxicity of the CD eight, and you have this uh, marker in yes. the in the in, the CD, in your yes, LEDs. Yes. So. Could be that is the ones that are really more prone for cytotoxicity. Yes, it's an old paper. I guess two thousand eight or something like that. Yeah, so maybe they are they are more active. That that's a good that's a good thing that we can count in the lesions right away. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, uh, Ken. Kefala, Ken, want to say something? I saw no, that you. No, 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 I was just gonna um, just comment about the. Yeah, you know, hyperactivated T cell induced death when you take a T cell and, and chronically activate it, and especially in an inflammatory environment, you'll get expression of fast, fast ligand and eventual death of the cells. Um, and that was one of the, so we, we have some nice panels now that we can really subdivide the, the CD8 cells in um, based on exhaustion markers and, and uh, death inducing markers, memory subpopulations and, and uh, the need for engagement of, of MHC peptide versus um, some other unspecific uh, mechanisms. Um, so there, the, you know, we, I think this, this point you mentioned, Daniel, of um, you know, whether, whether which, which exact T cells are, are, in, are undergoing this process and whether they're related to a natural progression of death of all mentioned is something that uh, it could could very well be true. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see what is the natural the natural reason for this uh, this mechanism. Uh, I think I think you could do like by staining is is going to be quite easy. You take the yes. the slides and do the stainings directly and to check uh, these. Or uh, our other uh, another possibilities. Uh, uh, I think Claudia can help much more than me is taking the, the cells from biopsies and, and try to reproduce uh, in vitro, but uh, to, to see uh, with much yeah, so, clearer so, than, than, than so, the, this kind of... 
Yeah, so people in Bahia, Lucas is here. Uh, they they've done some work in trying to obtain cells from lesions. They, you can act. There's a few things that you can do regarding the LEDs themselves. One thing that we were concerned is because I remember when Amanda was in the lab, she mentioned that she, you know she was always very concerned about the manipulation of the cells because the, she said you know you have to be really careful. Anything can activate and and, and lead to that. So we were a little bit concerned about taking the cells out of the lesion and that, you know, that process, which is quite, quite stressful for the cell could actually lead to the activation before or the release of the LEDs before we could actually see it. That's why we chose to do the, you know, the, the staining with the cells right there and trying to, to, to do, um, you know, to conjugate with whatever we could to try to identify. If you already uh, saw everything in the slide, it could be a good idea to try to get, because for instance, for neutrophils that are really fresh cells, we can manipulate all the time and you, you can preserve them. So I think that you we did a lot of experiments uh, extracting the cells from the lesions using liveries and these kind of things. And See. we can get good uh, viability of cells. So they are, of course, stimulated, but wow, because they are on the lesion, <laughs> stimulated yeah, all yes. the time. So I think it could be a good idea, actually. We could, we could give it a try, yes. Okay, Dan. Uh, yeah, I have one for Twebert. So uh, you showed a, a, a very nice data with your your PD-1 expression in, in, in T cells. Uh, did you check which, which cells express more PD, uh, PD-1 uh, in terms of T cell compartment, like a, a, a staining for CD62 and or just to see which compartment express more PDL or is more affected after the treatment? We are, we are looking now, Danny, because uh, we are more interested to see if the real effect, effect of T cells are, are affected or not, or if there is all the compartments. So we are trying now. So we did the experiment yesterday. I <laughs> think so the, the students done. So we are trying to, it's hard because Leishmania Brasiliensis is not Brasiliensis, that you have this, and you use the Leishmania major antigens to this cross. So we know that it will be, hard to talk about leishmania major antigen, but it's the only way, you know, to because if you use leishmania mazarinsis antigens, it's apoptosis on T-cells compartment. So so we are trying to see then. Okay, nice. Thank you. We need to go deep now. Yeah, that's the point. So Herbert, I have, I have one too. Thanks for the talk. Very, very nice. Very uh, interesting. So and, you know, I've I've um, I've been working with a cohort of melanoma uh, patients, cancer cancer patients, that are treated with uh, anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-1 anti-CTLA-4, and we follow them prospectively. And one of the things that we're um, very interested in and studying in more depth is the adverse events, the autoimmune uh, reactions. And in melanoma, um, you do see with cancer patients treated with anti-PD-1, you see a range of uh, autoimmune uh, uh, adverse events, and they tend to be clustered by cancer types. So if you have lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, you get more uh, pneumonitis and, and uh, lung-related adverse events, and with melanoma, more skin-related. And then you also have lots of intestinal-related uh, issues in, in, in patients across all, all cancers. And my question in your mouse models, I wonder if it's feasible or if you've noticed um, any, any skin uh, related uh, autoimmune reactivity, um, given that we're working with Leishmania and you have activated T cells in cutaneous tissues, I'm wondering if um, this is also going to be more of a trigger. It's, it's quite different, of course, because of the targets, you know, in melanoma, you actually have, you know, skin cells uh, being involved in the immune response. Um, but I'm curious about this aspect of, uh, potential adverse events and whether you see any of those in your mouse model, if you can detect that, um, if you've had a chance to see any of that. Well, it's a very good question. Can we try to see uh, if there is some problems. We did not see 
but you know, I think we should do more treatments. I think yeah. because usually, for example, in, in, in patients, the amount is very high in compressed that you use. Because when we saw the express of PD1 in PD1 on BALBC, it's very high. So we decided to decrease the dose. For Leishmania Donovan, I think you use it one gram of per dose and you use it 100 micrograms per dose. So maybe if you will increase the dose, maybe yeah. we can see some, you know, immune. No, no, immune response yeah. or skin response. Maybe as a just a suggestion on on some of these future experiments, maybe um, just get some uh, distal skin biopsies uh, that you can later look and see if you've induced any uh, greater uh, infiltration into healthy, uh, quote unquote, healthy uh, skin tissue as a, as a measure. And some of the intestinal stuff is more. Uh, more more prevalent, of course, uh, the intestinal inflammation. Um, yeah, they're very, very, very interesting. We have a problem because the price of the antibody for us here in Brazil to treat in vivo, <laughs> it's so expensive. So yeah. it yeah. has been hard, right? So, and, and so the anti-PD-1, we use the human antibody because there is cross, but the anti-PD-1, we need to use the mouse. And it's very expensive for us. So, yeah. but we are trying to, is, yeah. to to be in contact to try to see to use more anti PD one donation from the company. And but we need we have a lot of interesting. Of, I'm not thinking about in the future to treat, but for example, in the physical analysis analysis, there are some patients that appear that die because they don't have treatment. You treat with interferon gamma, and then you put anti plus interferon gamma. And those patients die. We know that the few numbers that we have, but maybe if you treat those small numbers of patients that have diffuse contamination analysis, we can try to give you more life for those. You know, yeah. I think my idea is for that. So I, I mm -hmm. talked to Alda, Dr. Alda from Field Group, that we are the same lab, and about this possibility to start it, to try to see in Brazil. And I was trying to talk to Paul K about that. To, it's for in my opinion, it's not for all, but for some patients that has failure in the treatment or the physical yeah. condition we, we have to try. It's one possibility. Yeah. I'm not sure if it work, but I think yeah. for those with the physical condition maybe it's a hope, you know? Yeah. Okay, we have comments here in the chat from Bartira, from Diogo Maciel, from Cristiano Shein, from Patrícia Escobar, Olivia Bacelar, Maria Bedio, all thanking you all for your, for your talks and uh, for the excellent uh, symposium. Um, so I think I will turn the, the, the coordination to, to both of you for the concluding remarks, yeah? You are perfect, Val. Thank you so, so much. So thank you so thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you all for your great talks and your participation as well. Thank you, Elvira. Thanks everyone, Claudia, for being here. Uh, Nathan yeah. is raising his hands. Yeah, yeah. No, for moving for moving away from the question session, then, then maybe <laughs> I just wanted to throw a couple of comments. Well done, out there. Nathan. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, Mostly towards Ken. Ken, I really, really enjoyed your emphasis on the importance of of uh, timing, um, yeah. and this whole concept that you know what's protective early might not be protective uh, late. We didn't talk too much about vaccination over the last uh, couple of days, uh, mostly about treatment, which which I, I think is fine because we're always talking about vaccination. Um, but you know, I I am. You know, I'm definitely a firm believer in that that sort of basic concept that that this you know early is where things are at. Um, so I'm just kind of interested in your in your in, in your thoughts about you know where this leaves prophylactic vaccination, and uh, you know we're we're good at generating you know central memory T cells, but you know is is this a is this a red herring in, in Th1 immunity? Yeah, um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's an exciting area of, of discussion. Um, I, I remember back many, 
I don't, I, I, several, several years ago um, with uh, Steve Reed was uh, talking about one of his early vaccine um, opportunities. I'm not going to remember many details, but we, we, we were discussing uh, around this idea of uh, induction of, let's say, rapid burst um, uh, anti-leishmania activity that could be important for stopping the establishment of a patent infection upon upon that initial inoculation um, versus this this uh, immunopathology. You know, this was in the early 90s, late 90s, when we were really seeing um, using the flow cytometry in patients from Corte de Pedra um, the, in, in defining the cell populations that were in the patients with active disease. And at the same time, talking intensely about vaccines, um, and this this idea that we, we at some point we're going to cross that line, right? Where a strong Th1 inflammatory response with um, uh, with with memory is going to be important for an effective vaccine. But if you, depending on how how effective it is, you could end up also setting people up for more inflammatory responses and maybe more severe disease later. Um, I still do, I, I would err on the side, I guess, of, of still agreeing and thinking that a strong inflammatory response that will activate macrophages and have a, uh, a good first line of defense, NK cells could be important in that as well from some of the, you know, Bob's early mouse studies on, on the burst of gamma, IL-12 and stuff um, in that NK cell tying into the differentiation of th1 similar to what ramona showed for the b cells which i a lot of what she showed was kind of uh, new for me i'm a little embarrassed that i didn't there's so much literature right and uh i didn't realize there was as much out there as she uh presented um so that's a whole nother interesting aspect and one thing about the b cell you know the old super classic antigen presenting studies on b cells were always talking about how B cells would be particularly biased as APCs when there's really low antigen because they're going to compete much better for the antigen than your macrophage or your dendritic cell because they're going to capture it specifically. And so um, it, that, that's a whole other thing that I started thinking about, you know, in, in really today's session is, is where all does that all tie in if you're thinking about setting up a good protective immune response for, for a vaccine versus that that line for uh, immunopathology. And I guess basically what I'd say is a highly effective vaccine, great, it's safe. If you get 90, 90, 90 percent of the people are going to be protected with that strong inflammatory response, then that's perfect, right? Now, if it's a low efficacy vaccine, then you could be setting up a, a larger portion of people with an exacerbated inflammatory response that if they're still going to get a patent infection, then maybe you can end up inducing more immunopathology. So a lot of the answer for me would depend on how uh, kind of the cost benefit, um, how effective the vaccine is going to be and how many people are going to be out there that aren't protected, but with a hyperactivated inflammatory response and then how long live that is. Um, the whole thing of persistence and the role of antigen dose and uh, uh, maintaining that response over time would come into it as well. Yeah, very good, very um, uh, interesting stuff to continue yeah. thinking about. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thanks. Really Thanks. nice session. Really nice session. Thank you so much, Nathan and Ken. So, for the finish, it is I'm going to invite everybody that wants to speak. So, I'm going to start. And uh, to me, and for me, it was a great experience to do this meeting. Uh, everybody was so helpful and it was so easy to organize. So I need to say thank you for the chairs and the speakers that did the amazing meeting. So thank you so much. It was a great experience for us that we are missing world relation, SBPZ, SBI, so several other meetings that we can meet each other. So for me, it was amazing. So thank you so much all. So Daniel, I'm going to pass the word for you. Oh, thanks, Herb. Ah, it's the same. Uh, I mean, the, the things start quite small and in the end become quite big. Our idea was just organize a simple, a simple lecture for the post-graduation. 
and we decided to invite some 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 people that we we really love the work or the subjects that we are interested to 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 learn a little bit more and and people start to accept and, and then we started to to be more like uh thinking a bit higher and then the the the, the meeting is now as uh, is, it is working inside. right yeah <laughs> yeah work it pretty good so and Ebert said uh, uh says one thing that is is true uh when everybody helps the things become much much more easier and and was and, and to organize this meeting was quite easy because everybody helps a lot so thank you very much for for accept uh, chairs and speakers thank you very much for for the the support that that the Brazilian uh, the SBI uh, SBPZ and SBP gave to us so it was a pleasure to organize and and we're going to consider it, uh, to organize or or being uh, more uh, uh, for other work more for others meetings uh, thank you very much guys Hello, oh, can I talk to everyone? Claudia? No, just to, to thank to you and, and Daniel. Thank you for the amazing uh, uh, meeting. I think it was really, really good. All these days that we discuss and we discuss science after and leishmania after so many, <laughs> so, so much time. So it was really, really nice. And thank you very much for the effort. And it was a pleasure to participate in this symposium. Thank you. Thank you so much. And before finishing, I'd like to say thank you for Julio and for SBP because uh, SBP supported us. You use his channel and uh, each channel and Julio so they give us all support for this transmission. Thank you so much, Julio. Muito obrigado, Julio. And thank you so much all. So hope to see you guys in World Lace. But as Val said, it's a idea to maintain in Moon yes. So I'd like to thank you for this idea. I was talking to Daniel yesterday about that. Daniel, I think they, they are working well. So we have to maintain <laughs> since we are back. So let's think about that. So thank you for your support, Val. Because uh, it will be the first, it will be the first steady virtual Leishmania immuno Leishmania meeting ever. Because <laughs> you, world Leish will be in person. Yeah, we'll all be in Cartagena next year. Oops, so, so we can yeah. keep it virtual. It's fantastic. Yeah, uh, I agree with the idea. Yeah, I I think I think uh, it's a good idea because it's quite easy. I mean, uh, for sure, in person is much. Fun. So we can we can be in touch. We can have the proper Kaipurian chatting. So here also we can have a Kaipurian, but it's not the same fun as used to be in person. But yeah. one PM is a little bit <laughs> fun, yeah? yeah, exactly. But I think I think it's, it's nice to 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 have uh, uh, speakers from from everywhere. Uh, as we had in this in this in this symposium, so I think it's a good idea. We're going to consider. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, guys. It was really uh, a great opportunity and nice to meet some new uh, new new Lech maniacs as well around the around the globe. Um, yeah, as well as the old ones. As well as the old ones, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, the, uh, I, I think it's all our inspiring works. So the old ones and the new ones. So ho hope people use some some data or some concepts that was presented here to help uh, their lives in lab or or mm -hmm. other places. So go oh, on. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, guys. My video was off for a bit because I was trying to get dinner in between the talks <laughs> because it's almost going for 10 o'clock here. But I just want to say a big thank you to Herbert and, and Daniel for the invitation, for the organization, and, and, a, and a great conference. And I look forward to seeing you guys in Cape Town uh, for World's Lish. And 
hope to keep up uh, with the networking and um, interaction from now until then. Thank you so much. So it's a Lucas. great idea that I think you should uh, continue to organize this kind of meeting because it was really very nice. And thank you very much for the organization and all the talks and to invite me and everything. So it was just great. Thank you. And we don't need to hurry for the checkout, <laughs> which is what typically <laughs> happens in the meetings. I gotta oh go, God. I have to check out. Gotta get my bags out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yes, right, Everton and, yes. and Daniel, thanks very much for the chance you know, you. to present the data. Nice, very nice meeting. Oh, it was, it was very nice. Uh, it, it's nice also because we, we don't see the, the, the luggage here because used to having the, the closing conference, a lot of people with the, the bags and whatever. So <laughs> here we can stay more comfortable, but okay. Thanks, the pleasure was mine, uh, Lucas. Yeah. Thanks so much and thank you guys, thank you. You are so good organizers that we elected you and Herbert for the next <laughs> year to organize again, the second Immunolage Symposium, okay? <laughs> okay, thanks. Great, thank you. <laughs> they are competing with Kipich uh, Kip Cheng. <laughs> to a, a competing meeting. Yeah, I have really to go now. Thank you very much. Bye for Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks so much, guys. Bye. Thank you, Nate. Bye. 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 Bye bye, guys. Keep safe. Bye, okay? bye, bye. Keep safe. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you.